Dennis. Those questions are yours. Your Honor. Amen. I will. Attorney, manager. How are you? Nice to see you all. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Friday's pretty late. Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order for August the 5th, 2019. And I certainly want to welcome everyone here. We're very glad to have you. I uh, also want to say to my council colleagues, welcome back, and to the manager and our attorney and all of our staff. We have had a nice vacation. But uh, now we're back to our serious work, and it's uh, great to see everyone. I would like to ask now if you all would please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Was it a wide shot? Thank you. What's his name? CG1, turn on CG1. Thank you. And it's just not working. Thank you. And now, Councilmember Reese, would you please lead us in the pledge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, colleagues and members of the public. If it's your practice to do so, and if you're able, please join us as we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Council Member. Madam Clerk, would you please yes. call the roll? Mayor Sewell. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council Member Alston. Here. Council Member Caballero. Here. Council Member Freeman. Present. Council Member Middleton. Here. And Council Member Reese. Here. Thank you. Sure. Now we will move to our ceremonial items. And the first of our ceremonial items is a proclamation for the, the cleft and craniofacial awareness month. And I would like to call up Dr. Jeffrey Marcus and uh, Marilyn Taylor and anyone else that uh, they might like to bring with them. 30 family members or friends, please come up. Are you Marilyn? Yes. Hey Marilyn, great to see you. I'm Steve. Are you going to talk into this microphone? Let's make it happen, okay? Here, come on over here so everybody can see you. Come right, stand right in this little area, right here. Come right over there. Super, you got it. Okay, go for it. Um, I've... Hang on, I forgot. I've... <laughs> Thank you for the proclamation. Um, <laughs> for the club lip. Thank you, Dr. Marcus. Good job. Good job. <laughs> We're going to, here, hand me the mic now, and I'm going to uh, just say a few things, and I'm going to let Dr. Marcus, if he would like to say a few things. Um, but Marilyn, thank you so much for being here. You're the star of the show, and we're really glad that you're here tonight. I'm going to read this proclamation and um, present it to you all. 
Whereas orofacial clefts are the most frequently occurring birth defects in the United States, affecting about one in 700 in infants per year. And whereas infants born with clefts and other craniofacial conditions usually require surgery as well as specialized feeding support, dental and orthodontic care, speech therapy, hearing intervention, and social and emotional support as they grow and develop. And whereas this complexity of services need to be provided in a synchronized manner over a period of years and are best provided by interdisciplinary cleft and craniofacial teams, and whereas organizations such as the Cleft Palate Foundation, the American Cleft Palate, and Craniofacial Association serve populations affected by craniofacial differences and the professionals who care for them in order to help infants have a healthy start to life by providing their families with comprehensive information, support, and connections to the, these interdisciplinary teams. And whereas it is fitting and proper to recognize the efforts of organizations and programs, such as the Cleft and Craniofacial Program at Duke University and its families, working to ensure a better life for those affected by cleft lip and palate and other craniofacial conditions. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim July 2019 as Cleft and Craniofacial Awareness Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to contribute however they are able to the support of families and organizations working to aid those affected by craniofacial birth defects. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this fifth day of August, 2019, and I want to present this, Dr. Marcus, to you and to Marilyn, uh, and if you have a few words that you would like to add to hers, we'd be happy to have you do so. That's for you. Thank you. Mayor Shul, I want to uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to be here on behalf of our entire team uh, at Duke, and thank all of our, our team members who are all here today, and Marilyn and her family for being here. Uh, Marilyn is my is my patient, and uh, she was born with cleft lip and palate. And uh, kids with this condition, if you even now, even today, uh, often may have uh, up to eight to ten surgeries before they're ten or twelve years old, which is uh, uh, something that we wholeheartedly uh, try to avoid, want to avoid, and uh, we consider uh, to be unreasonable now. And um, it's our goal to uh, take care of kids with these conditions in the fewest number of surgeries possible to make them grow up so that they can feel like and look like all other, all other children. And uh, I appreciate this, uh, and we thank you on behalf of our team and on behalf of Duke and Duke Plastic Surgery, uh, where I'm the chair uh, of the department. Um, uh, we, we can tell you, I can tell you, I, you know, in, having been in practice in a number of other institutions and a number of other cities and having operated uh, all over the, uh, the world, uh, taking care of uh, cleft lip and palate, um, I can tell you that uh, those kids who, uh, who are here in Durham, North Carolina, are getting the very, very best care that is possible ab absolutely anywhere, and we give you our word that we'll continue to do so. <laughs> Guys, why don't you stand up? Some of our team members here tonight. Right. Yeah, sure. Come on, let's get a picture. Mm -mm. I've broken a lot of cameras. I want to warn you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Marilyn, good job. Keep it going. You're an awesome kid. Great. We're Thank really you. glad you came. Come back sometime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcus, and the folks here from your program, and Marilyn and family. Really wonderful to see everybody today. Um, our second, I'm go our second uh, proclamation tonight. I'm going to ask Council Member Charlie Reese, He's behind you. He's right behind me, to join me here at the podium, and we're going to have a proclamation for Love and Respect Ministry. I'd like to ask Dennis Garrett, anyone he would like to bring up with him, uh, to please come up as well. Dennis, I know you're out there someplace. There he is. Come on up, <laughs> Council Member Reese. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a great night for the city of Durham. We get to uh, celebrate one of the city's unsung heroes, Dennis Garrett, who runs Love and Respect House. I'm going to read the proclamation, and then Mr. Garrett will share a few words with us, if that's all right. <clears throat> Whereas Love and Respect started in June 2002 as a therapeutic living community for men who have practiced unhealthy living situations, primarily substance abuse with a focus on reducing drug dependency, crime, homelessness, gang involvement, HIV, AIDS, and STDs. 
And whereas the program is open to all persons of every background, learning a new way to live through classroom instruction and discussion on drug intervention, attitudes and behaviors, continuing education, as well as attending NA meetings. And whereas Love and Respect has a wide variety of community involvement projects, such as cleaning up trash and litter, spearheading abandoned building demolition, converting an unused house into a donation-only center for special events, and building a playground in a low-income neighborhood. And whereas every June, Love and Respect hosts their Take Back the Streets March with booths that offer ID cards for children, HIV testing, anti-drug and crime programs, and healthcare. And whereas in December, they sponsor an annual toy giveaway that coordinates toy donations to be distributed to children of low-income families for the holidays. And whereas Love and Respect has contributed greatly to the caring nature of our community through its leadership and vision to improve the lives of Durham residents. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby recognize and show appreciation for love and respect for the great impact they've made in our community, not only for the past 17 years, but for many years to come. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this fifth day of August, 2015. Congratulations, Dennis. Uh, what I want to just say is love and respect, <clears throat> and like, to shorten this up, what we do is intervention, crime prevention. We try and take our youths and turn them into productive members of society. I'd like to thank the city council. I'd like to especially say to Deidreana, thank you for all you do, like for coming out. Charlie, thank you. Where, where I'm Charlie. And like, like Mark, you and I are going to establish a relationship. We're going to work this thing. We're talking about this gun violence. We're tired of these, 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 these ride bys these shootings, this gun. This, like, we got to do something different to take our streets back. So I'm asking you to not let me stand there with a piece of paper. That ain't what it's about. Let's save some lives together. Congratulations to Dennis and love and respect. And Charlie, thank you very much. Our third item. Uh, is regarding the Hillside Park Basketball Courts Award presentation. And I believe we're going to hear from Ben Howell, who's going to be our presenter. Is that right? Great. Come on up. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for having me here at the City Council meeting tonight on behalf of the North Carolina chapter of the American Planning Association. My name is Ben Howell, president of APANC, and I'm here to present the APANC Great Places People's Choice Award for great public art to the, city, to the city for the Hillside Basketball Courts. The Great Places in North Carolina is an awards program created in 2012 to highlight North Carolina's great places and the communities and people that have created them. North Carolina is full of amazing places that make the state a wonderful place to live, bring important money and jobs into our community, and keep our communities thriving. Many people work hard to create, sustain, and improve these places, including citizens, planners, business leaders, and elected officials. The Hillside basketball courts were chosen for the colorful murals and renovated facilities, which are thanks to a partnership between the Grant Hill Foundation, Fela Sports Brand, and the City of Durham's Department of Parks and Recreation. This partnership funded the renovations of three outdoor basketball courts, new backboards, and updates to the fencing and landscaping. I would like to recognize the talent behind the artwork, local artist Sarah Lane Calva as well. Mayor Shule and council members, it's my pleasure to recognize the Hillside Basketball Courts as a 2019 People's Choice winner for the great public art in North Carolina and would like to present you with this frame certificate on behalf of the North Carolina chapter of the American Planning Association. Thank you. Ben, thank you so much. And uh, do we have a video that we're going to show? Gonna show it after okay. Brief Rhonda, remarks. please, please do. I'll hold this fabulous thank award. <laughs> I'm Rhonda Parker. I'm the proud director of Durham Parks and Recreation. And I'm so happy to be here uh, accepting this award for the city of Durham and Durham Parks and Recreation. Um, it was a labor of love. But there's a lot of people I need to thank, and I'd like to thank Ben Howell and his organization for recognizing Hillside Park basketball courts and coming out here and taking time to present this to us. Thank you, Ben. I also would like to thank 
Councilman Charlie Reese, who insisted that this first project should come to Durham because this is where Grant Hill got his start. So thank you, Councilman Reese. And also Durham City Council and the city manager's office for supporting us when we receive um, in inquiries about doing different initiatives like this. You are always supportive of, of us and we appreciate that. And because the residents of Durham benefit from all of this. Our DPR project team led by Annette Smith. We have Annette Smith here and uh, Tom Dawson, our assistant director. Our Tamia and Grant Hill Foundation and Fila USA, they were just awesome for their can-do attitude and whatever project needed, they were willing to do. Of course, our artist, Sarah Lane Kelva, um, her unique way of, of the mural, it's just beautiful. Uh, Simon Betzello and the members of the Public Art Committee who um, submitted the nomination for Hillside Basketball Court. We appreciate that. Our Durham Parks Foundation, who uh, the, where the funds came through for to manage this project. Our Recreation Advisory Commission, who are advocates for the residents of Durham and DPR. And last but not least, the Hillside Park. <laughs> And of course, I have to say our DPR team that are always willing and, and excited about these projects, our DPR team stand up also. <laughs> we wanna thank the Hillside Park and WD Hill community because they have been supportive and been out there. They came out on a stormy day to celebrate this great uh, feature in our park. Our goal is to provide opportunities for the community to play more, and we are proud to do that. And we are pr also proud that one of the oldest parks in our park system has been restored to the gem that it once was. All we ask the residents to do is to come out and enjoy the park, play ball, uh, be out there with your families, and help us to preserve this great gem that we have now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Tee up the video. <laughs> I think it's important to have safe, fun areas of play. Places where people can come together, can galvanize the community. The young people especially can take values from playing, from activities, from the game of basketball. We're here in Durham, North Carolina, a city that is near and dear to my heart. Here at Hillside Park, Fila, along with my foundation, collaborated on renovating a series of basketball courts. And one of the great things that we're doing is having a chance to impact communities in a positive way. My experience in doing these kind of projects is when we beautify something, we invest in areas that haven't seen a great deal of tender loving care. That pride spreads throughout the community. The colors are popping and the mural is amazing. I've seen a lot of basketball courts, but I haven't seen one quite like this. I wanted to evoke a very cheerful and happy feeling, so I incorporated vibrant colors, and I also wanted it to serve as an inspiration for children and adults. Having this incredible bright beacon is going to attract all sorts of people to come here, and they're going to feel safe and happy to be here. Fila and myself were both grateful to be in a position to do something that the community here and the residents here can have an opportunity to enjoy, to use, and to really have a sense of pride and a sense of ownership for their park and for their basketball courts. All right. Our sound wasn't quite what we wanted it to be, but I think you got the idea. It is a beautiful basketball court. And Rhonda, I want to thank you. And I don't see the artist here. Is the artist here? Well, it was a beautiful, it's an absolutely beautiful court. And everybody should go out and take the opportunity to check it out. So thank you very much. You. I do want to say that uh, I guess now that Councilmember Reese is such good friends with Grant Hill that he's going to be a Duke fan from here. <laughs> All right, our next item is our proclamation for National Night Out, and I would like to ask uh, Chief C.J. Davis to please come forward, as well as Councilmember Vernetta Austin, who's gonna do the honors on this proclamation.
Whereas on Tuesday, August 6th, 2019, the city of Durham will observe the 36th annual National Night Out, joining forces with more than 16,000 communities from all 50 states, U.S. territories, Canadian cities, and military bases worldwide. And whereas in all, some 38 million people are expected to participate in America's Night Out against crime, in Durham, more than 90 neighborhoods and community groups have registered with the Durham Police Department this year to hold National Night Out events, signifying their commitment to promote police community partnerships, crime, drug, and violence prevention, and neighborhood unity. And whereas National Night Out is sponsored annually by the National Association of Town Watch, spearheaded locally by the City of Durham Police Department, and supported by the Public Safety Forces of North Carolina Central University Police, Duke University Police, the Durham County Sheriff's Office, and the City of Durham Fire Department. And whereas National Night Out is supported by the active participation and in-kind services of Durham residents, City of Durham departments, community agencies, and businesses who are committed to the city's mission to provide an excellent and sustainable quality of life. And whereas while shining a spotlight on community police programs, National Night Out increases connections between those who serve and their neighborhoods through the programs they provide. And whereas it is essential that all neighbors of the city of Durham come together with police and work together to build a safer, more caring community. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim August 6, 2019 as National Night Out in Durham and call upon all residents of the city of Durham to join in support of the Durham Police Department. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fifth day of August, 2019. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Um, very quickly, thank you very much, um, Mayor Shule and Council Member Austin and all of the council members who religiously love National Night Out. Yes, I'll have a bus this year as well. Uh, so we look forward to being out in the community this year. It's one of our favorite nights of the year, one of our um, events where we can all let our hair down a little bit, get a little wobble on. <laughs> Yes, we dance too, <laughs> but um, we look forward to um, this year's National Night Out. This past week has been a horrific week for this country, and it just resonates with us that this is an opportunity for us to reinforce the commitment and the relationship that we have with the community here in the city of Durham and, and fellowship. So thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Councilmember Austin. If you have not been to a National Night Out celebration in your neighborhood, you can find one near you. They are amazing. It is a wonderful, wonderful night, uh, especially if you like hot dogs, which I do. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be eating a lot of them, but uh, it's really a great night in Durham. All righty, our last, uh, our last uh, ceremonial item tonight is with our public historian, Eddie Davis, for one of our history moments regarding the Algonquin Tennis Club and the North Carolina Highway Historical Marker. So I'm going to ask uh, former Council Member Davis to please come forward and uh, bring up anyone he would like to have come up with him. Well, if we're bringing up people, why don't we ask uh, Dr. Victor Maffo and Mr. Nathan Garrett if they would come forward and stand with me. Uh, and Mrs. Evelyn, New Mrs. Evelyn Roberts. And one of our city employees, um, yes, um, Michelle, not Michelle, Melissa. Melissa Roberts. Let's, let's ask Marcus Hughes to come up too and stand with us all. Uh, thank you and good evening, Mass Shul, uh, members of the city council, uh, city staffers, and members of the audience. Uh, we are now over halfway through 2019, which means that our sesquicentennial year is more than halfway over. We've got lots of things to celebrate before we end up in November 2nd, on November 2nd, I believe. On Thursday, August the 15th, uh, Durham will unveil its 24th North Carolina Highway Historical Marker. The Algonquin Tennis Club will join the ranks of Duke Homestead, Governor William B. Umstead, the Royal Ice Cream City Inn, Polly Murray, Black Wall Street, 
the Rural Credit Union and Stagville and other state markers in our city and county. The application and the official procedures for the Algonquin marker were initiated almost two years ago by Dr. Victor Maffo, who is here with us. Uh, so let's give him a round of applause. Uh, Dr. Maffo is a retired North Carolina Central professor and a former executive at North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company. From, two th from 1922 until it burned in the mid-1960s, the Algonquin Tennis Club hosted tournaments and ex exhibition matches for black athletes, among them Althea Gibson, Arthur Ashe, and many of Durham's top tennis players. The American Tennis Association, a black group that promoted tennis across the nation, included Durham and the Algonquin on its tournament circuit. Dr. Hubert Eaton of, of uh, Wilmington, with whom Althea Gibson lived for a while, um, is given credit for the development of women's tennis. Likewise, Dr. Walter Whirlwind Johnson of Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, went Lynchburg, Virginia, um, is credited with Arthur Ashe's training and support. The Algonquin Tennis Club members, many of whom were associated with businesses, institutions, and groups within the historic Haytai community, entertained and offered robust athletic competition for each of these national tennis legends. In fact, there are or histories uh, that celebrate the victory of a young Joe Williams, a Durhamite, over an equally young Arthur Ashe in a tournament here in Durham during the 1950s. Also, there is an um, authentic victory by Nathan Garrett uh, uh, by a, um, in an interstate uh, tournament that was held uh, here in Durham uh, over lots of outstanding competition from around the country. Of course, North Carolina Tennis Hall of Fame members Bonnie Logan and John Lucas had early contact with the Algonquin. Although it was a membership club, the Algonquin reached out far beyond its membership roster and introduced the world of tennis to a wide array of youth. Even though there were and still are numerous clubs across North Carolina that provided tennis instruction during segregation and beyond, the Algonquin Tennis Club was unique because it became a magnet for a broad spectrum of purposes. It provided civic, entrepreneurial, social, and political meeting space for Durham's African-American residents. Historically, it was at the Algonquin on Thursday, August the 15th, 1935, that the Durham Committee on Negro Affairs was formed. The Durham Committee on Negro Affairs, now the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, um, remains a powerful political force in Durham's black community. The committee has sought to give a voice to all African Americans in Durham and to provide a community outlet for the political energy and the multiple other aspirations of Durham's black residents. The Durham Business and Professional Chain was also formed at the Algonquin in 1937. This group, which is still vibrant, grew out of Booker T. Washington's National Negro Business League, of which C.C. Spaulding served as the national president during the 1930s. The Algonquin Tennis Club marker will be erected adjacent to Durham's W.D. Hill Recreation Center on Fayetteville Street. The unveiling will take place on Thursday, August the 15th. Immediately following the unveiling, a brief commemorative program will be held in the gymnasium at W.D. Hill. Uh, that program will be hosted by the husband and wife team of Nathan and Wanda Garrett. And of course, Nathan is behind me smiling right now. <laughs> I'll tell Wanda that you were smiling. Uh, uh, and and uh, in tonight's audience, there may be others who are a part of the planning committee, but I would like to recognize the folks who are here with us today for the outstanding work that they've done over the last few um, weeks to try to make sure that the event will be a roaring success. We'd also like to thank the Durham Parks and Recreation Department under the leadership of Rhonda Parker. They have been outstanding. They have worked with us very closely. They've made sure that all the things that we want to provide on that 
day uh, are going to take place. Uh, they have uh, made sure that we uh, have a wonderful experience, not only with the unveiling of the marker and the program that we'll have, but also some related exhibits that they're going to put up. So it's going to be a wonderful activity, Mr. Mayor. And we hope that you will be able to be with us. I think you said that your trip uh, to New Orleans hopefully will be uh, completed by that time. And we'd like to invite all the members of the council and the staff and others to be present and to make sure that this is a wonderful tribute that we can give to the ladies and gentlemen that provided all kinds of wonderful activities for the youth of Durham, North Carolina, particularly during the era of segregation. So thank you so much. I don't know if there's people, anyone who'd like to uh, make a Does anyone else would like to make a comment? Uh, if not, then we want to thank you, Mr. Mayor, and appreciate all the things that you do. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank Great you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you, Dr. Moffo. Nice to see you. Mr. Garrett, did you beat Mickey Mashaw in tennis, or did he beat you? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't unhappy about the outcome. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Garrett, I won't tell. Representative Mishaw, that you said that either. I, that'll be our little secret. Thank you. I know that. I know it. You all, thank you. What a great bunch of ceremonial items. And I just want to appreciate everybody for participating and bringing those items to us. It was a beautiful night at Durham City Council. I'm now going to ask if there are any announcements by members of the council. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Good evening to everyone in the chamber and those watching at home. It's good to be uh, back at work after a wonderful break. I'm glad to be here uh, with my colleagues. Mr. Mayor, tonight I want to express uh, solidarity with brothers and sisters in both El Paso and in Dayton. I also want to express solidarity, solidarity with your colleagues, Mayor Margo uh, and Mayor Whaley, respectively, and to our council colleagues, elected uh, colleagues uh, in both Dayton uh, in El Paso, many of whom I've had the pleasure of meeting through my work with the National League of Cities. Um, Mr. Mayor, since taking my oath in this chamber, I don't watch the news the same way anymore. And I'm sure uh, that goes for all of us up here. And when things like this happen, uh, we can't but help think of our own city. And we know who we are in Durham. We have staked out a position of national and international acclaim for our strong a stand against white supremacy and, and racism, and we have established that our city is welcoming to everyone. Um, and we know that there are people that may not be happy about that. So I want to, on tonight, um, ask that we turn uh, to each other and not on each other. Uh, I'm also going to ask and uh, uh, emphasize and, and hope, lean in the hope, uh, that those who are charged uh, not only with um, our well-being uh, in terms of establishing a positive environment, but those who are charged with our physical uh, well-being as well, uh, that we would do uh, all that is necessary to make sure that they have all that they need uh, to safeguard uh, our city. Um, I don't know when's the last time we brushed off our, our catastrophic response plan, but I, I know uh, we're on that type of stuff. Uh, but one of the things I heard, Mr. Mayor, was that uh, in El Paso that uh, the um, first responders there uh, not only practice with each other, but they are in constant contact with uh, soft target managers and those that uh, have leadership positions in areas that are open. Um, I'm sure this has already been thought of, but I just want to, on the record tonight, uh, uh, express my support, and I know I'm sure my colleagues would agree with this, express my support for doing all we can to not only practice with other uniform responders, but if there's anything we can do uh, by way of uh, information sharing, or preparation or training with those who are in private security at our malls, at our theaters, uh, all around our city, that we do that uh, and that we remain constantly uh, vigilant. Um, I'm a person of faith. My prayers uh, are, are embrace everyone tonight um, in those cities and around our country. And certainly, um, 
uh, leadership in those cities and to first responders uh, in those cities and around the country as well. And uh, we are Durham, we will remain Durham, um, and let's continue to be who we are. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council Member, thank you for those beautiful and very appropriate words. I really appreciate your expressing what I know is the sentiment of all of us up here, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Other announcements by members of the Council? Council Member Reese. Sorry to have to follow that. Um, thank you for that, Council Member Middleton. I just wanted to add one more note on the um, Hillside basketball courts, uh, just very briefly. Uh, one of my good friends, um, his name Kelly uh, Funk, she, until a couple of months ago, worked for FILA US as their national uh, sen senior vice president in charge of marketing. And she is the person at FILA most singularly responsible for bringing this project to the city of Durham. Um, and uh, just wanted to acknowledge her contribution to making this project happen in Durham. And, um, she was uh, here in Durham for a number of days leading up to the event and had to scramble when rain hit the city just <laughs> that morning. I uh, moved the event indoors where uh, Grant Hill uh, received the key to the city from me. It was exciting for him because he'd never gotten a key to the city. It was exciting to me for me because I'd never given a key to the city, but <laughs> we managed to work our way through it as a couple of rookies. Um, and uh, I'm definitely not a Duke fan, Mr. Mayor, but I'm definitely a Grant Hill fan. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Reason. I'm sure we can change that. Okay. Um, other, other announcements by members of the Council? I do have one announcement. I want to recognize a group of young people who are here from the Leaders for Democracy Fellowship Program. Uh, this is a cooperative program of the Center for International Development, the Sanford Institute, Institute at Duke, the Sanford School now at Duke, World Learning, and MEPI. And uh, Jonathan Abels is here, their uh, leader. Uh, and these students, approximately 15 of them, are all students who were here from the Middle East. I uh, had the opportunity to spend some time with them before the meeting. They're from Tunisia, Morocco, Israel, Lebanon, Algeria, Jordan. Tunisia, Jordan, and I may have gotten them all. Uh, and uh, they are students who were uh, very interested in civic engagement, uh, in democratic participation, uh, and it was a real, it's really a pleasure to have you all here. We're, we're very glad you're here, and uh, if we get boring, don't feel bad, you can leave. It's okay. <laughs> but we're very, very glad to have you. Uh, and now we'll proceed to priority items. And uh, first, I'd like to ask, are there any priority items by the city manager? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, there are no priority items this evening from the city manager's office. Madam, Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. The city attorney's office also has no priority items. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I do have a priority item. I would like to um, administer the oath of office to Earl Bradley. Madam yes. Clerk. Uh, we're going to first vote on Mr. Bradley's membership, and then that will be the appropriate time. But thank you very much. Once it's been approved. Yes, ma'am. Can I have a motion on the clerk's priority item? So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Uh, uh, items can be pulled by, from the consent agenda by any council member or resident who would like to pull an item, and those items will then be heard at the end of the meeting. These are items that have previously been worked on very seriously by the council and are now coming to the city council tonight uh, for a final decision. I will read the consent agenda items. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Durham Workers Right Commission appointment. Item three, travel performance audit, June 2019. Item four, government alliance on race and equity, GARE implementation and innovation fund grant award for welcome home. Item five, city of Durham and North Carolina Department of Transportation section 104F and section 133B37 transportation planning grant ordinance, FY 2020 and authorization to execute grant agreement. Item six, FY 2020 Federal Transit Administration, FDA section 5303, Metropolitan Transit Planning Grant Project Ordinance and Authorization to Execute Grant Agreement. 
Item 7, Bloomberg Marist Challenge Agreement between the City of Durham, Duke University Center for Advanced Hindsight. Item 8, Supplemental Agreement with Durham Chapel Hill Carver, a Metropolitan Planning Organization, and North Carolina Department of Transportation for the Congestion Management Web Application and Grant Project Ordinance. Item 9, Supplemental Agreement with Durham Chapel Hill Carver, a Metropolitan Planning Organization, and North Carolina Department of Transportation for the Transportation Improvement Program TIP Web Application and Grant Project Ordinance. Item 10, EB 5708, NC 54 Sidewalk Project Supplemental Agreement. Item 12, Grant Agreement for the Safe Routes to School Non-Infrastructure Grant Program, TIP number EB 6033E. Item 13, Ordinance to Regulate Activity on Water Supply Protection Property Owned by the City. Item 14, Contract for Management Support Services for the Triangle Water Supply Partnership. Item 15, Flowers Drive Sanitary Sewer Outfall Transfer Agreement. Item 16, bid report May 2019. Item 17, bid report June 2019. Item 19, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development HUD 2019 Partnership Initiative Grant. Item 20, Government Alliance on Race and Equity GAIR Implementation and Innovation Fund Grant to further equitable community engagement. Item 21, contract for athletics booking agent. Item 22, reimbursement agreement with MI Homes of Raleigh LLC for the Andrews Chapel lift station. Item 23, utility extension agreement with Vadavo Durham LLC to serve Abbeville Wood. Item 24, U.S. Geological Survey USGS Nutrient Load Contract Extension Agreement. Number 16 ESMPN 00000027. Item 30, Munis Software Annual Support and License Agreement for 2019. Item 31, Aurigo Essentials Enterprise Software as a Service SAAS. You have heard the consent agenda, and I'll accept a motion for its approval. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. And now we will move on to our general business agenda, public hearings. Um, Mr. The, before you move, I'm sorry. Before you move forward, I just wanted to um, oh, Earl Bradley to you. Yeah. Go ahead. But I just wanted to thank staff for working closely with the Government Alliance for Racial Equity. I wasn't here at work session to really uplift um, the two staff members, Aaron and James, for really working to get those grants in here. I really appreciate them. Thank you. That work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, I'm sorry. I don't want to miss Earl Bradley. Earl, where are you? Here he comes. Um, Mr. Bradley, we just voted him in um, as a member of our Workers' Rights Commission, and he's here to be sworn in. And uh, if you'd like to bring anyone else with you, by all means, come on up. Come on up. Madam Clerk. Raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. I state your name. I, Earl Bradley. Do you hereby solemnly swear or affirm? Do you hereby swallowing and say affirm? That I will support. That I will support. And maintain the Constitution. And maintain the Constitution. And laws of the United States. And the laws of the United States. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. And laws of North Carolina. And the laws of North Carolina. Not inconsistent therewith. Not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully, that I will faithfully, and impartially, and impartially, discharge the duties, discharge the duties, of my office, of my office, as a member of, of the member of, the Workers' Rights Commission, the Workers' Rights Commission. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Bradley, and thank you, Madam Clerk. And now we will move on to our public hearing items. Um, we have two items tonight, item 32 and item 33, which are both quasi-judicial items, which we do not have very often in this chamber. Um, and uh, you will hear me reading from a script that has been mercifully prepared for me by our city attorney. Uh, and. Uh, we will proceed a little differently than usual on these uh, on these items, uh, but um, with her guidance, I know we will do well. <coughs> the next matter is agenda item 32, which includes a major special use permit application for the North Carolina Central University Student Center 
application number M1900001. The hearing of this matter is judicial in nature and will be conducted in accordance with special safeguards. Witnesses must be sworn in. They are subject to cross-examination and written evidence must be offered for incorporation into the record. Uh, people who wish to testify should have signed up on the special sheet for this, swearing, for this hearing at the clerk station. If you have not already done so, and you will wish to testify today, please go to the clerk station now, over to my left, and sign in. Anyone who plans to testify, including city staff, should now go to the clerk station to be sworn in or to give your affirmation, and then please return to your seat. So if you have not been sworn in and you are planning to testify tonight, uh, please go to the, uh, to the clerk station. Is anyone that wants to testify, this is, you will be sworn in at this time. Central. This is for item 32, the case in North, involving North Carolina Central University Student Center. Okay. <coughs> Please raise your right hand and place your left hand on the Bible. We'll pretend, if possible. And, it, and um, please affirm or swear, so help you God, by saying, I do, after I give the oath or affirmation. Do you solemnly swear, so help you God, or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, to the best of your ability? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, Madam Clerk, I do have a sign-up sheet, uh, and it might be wise for me to read the names and make sure that everyone that was sworn in is on this sheet. Would you agree with that, I would agree with Madam that. Attorney? I'm going to read the names of people on this sheet. If your name is not on this sheet and you were just sworn in, uh, if you could perhaps raise your hand and make yourself known to me. J.W. Smith. I'm having a hard time on that one. Uh, Ma so Amos. Mathers. I'll put one Matherson. I'm sorry. No Ms. Mathers, thank you for your help. Cornelius Wooten. Donnie Brown or Dion Brown. Frank Amenya. Neil Ghosh. Uh, Reinhard Kelly. Charles Kelly, Ronald McCoy, Maria Politzai, I'm sorry if I'm not getting your names correct, Dan Pabst. Are there others who have sworn in but whose name was not on the list? Um, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, uh, well, I, I know a couple of you. I see Jarvis Martin. Mr. Martin, I will put your name on the list. Yeah, I think there was, may have been some confusion. Uh, it's, a, it's a white sheet. Usually it is a yellow sheet, but it's a white sheet. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Can you tell me your name? Jillian Riley. Jillian Riley. Yes, of course. Hello, Ms. Riley. Anyone else whose name, who was going to testify on this item and whose name is not on this sheet? <coughs> Mr. Bryan, are you? You are? Okay. Anyone else who is planning to speak? All right, thank you. I'm sorry about the confusion about the white sheets and the yellow sheet. Usually it is our yellow sheet, Ms. Raleigh. Uh, but tonight, uh, because of the special procedure, we're doing it a little differently. <clears throat> and now I'm going to ask my council colleagues uh, about any council conflicts or special knowledge they may have of this case. <clears throat> Do any council members need to withdraw from consideration of this case because of a conflict that will prevent them from rendering a fair and impartial decision in this matter? Um, anyone? Have any council members heard information about this case other than what may have been presented at work session or in the staff report? If so, please disclose that information at this time. Thank you, colleagues. Now I'm going to explain the proceedings. Before we begin, I would like a representative or an attorney for the applicant and for any opponents to come to the microphone and identify yourself to the council and then take a seat in the front row. Mr. Bryant. 
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam, Pro, Madam Mayor Pro Ten, Madam Attorney. My name is Bill Bryan. I am with the Morningstar Law Group, 112 West Main Street, and I'm here on behalf of North Carolina Central University. Thank you very much. Mr. Gosh, are you planning to speak? If so, I think you would be good if you would please identify yourself as well. No problem, Mr. Mayor. My name is Neil Gosh, also an attorney at the Morningstar Law Group at 112 West Main Street. I would be here representing North Carolina Central University as well. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. Thank you. Are there any other attorneys uh, for the applicant or for any opponents who will be speaking tonight? Thank you. <coughs> so uh, if any attorney or representative wishes to cross-examine a witness, please raise your hand immediately after the witness has testified and I will recognize you. All written information, including maps you may want to be considered, should be officially submitted as evidence. Copies of evidence, that you want to have admitted, with the exception of the staff report and attachments, should be given to the city attorney and to the opposing side, if any. Each side may raise objections to the admission of evidence on the basis of relevance, hearsay, or any other evidentiary ground. Questions concerning admissibility will be handled by the city attorney. Please do not hand anything directly to council members until it has first been reviewed by the city attorney and has been admitted as evidence. We will first hear from the city staff who have studied the request, then from the applicant, and then from opponents to the application, if any. We will now open the hearing and hear from the city staff. <coughs> Good evening, I'm Eliza Monroe representing the planning department. I would like to state for the record that all planning department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law, and affidavits of all notices are on file in the planning department. Planning staff requests that all agenda items, agenda materials submitted for the public hearing at hand be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. Request for a, mi a major special use permit, M1900001, and a major site plan, D1800303, have been received from Bill Bryan with Morningstar Law Group, representing North Carolina Central University, and from O'Brien Atkins Associates, respectively, to construct a 2.5-story student center on the campus of North Carolina Central University, totaling 105,000 square feet on a 1.48-acre portion of the 8.99-acre site, zoned currently residential urban-52, or RU-52, and University College-2, or UC-2, and is located within the urban tier. A university or college use requires an issuance of a major special use permit, MSUP, pursuant to the Unified Development Ordinance, otherwise known as UDO, section 5.1.2 in the use table. When a site plan is associated with a required major special use permit, the site plan shall also be considered a major site plan, which requires governing body approval. If the council approves the major special use permit, then the council should also consider the approval of the associated major site plan, case D1800303. The site plan item does not require a public hearing, but it does require a separate vote for approval. If the council elects to deny the major special use permit, the associated major site plan should not be approved as the site plan would not be in compliance with applicable UDO standards. The public hearing item before you is the major special use permit M190001. The applicant proposes the construction of a university of college use building within a residentially zoned zoning district, which requires the issuance of a major special use permit. A site plan has been submitted in conjunction with this request. It's going to be attachment 3B within your packets. That site plan is currently under review and is free of comments. Per UDO section 3.9.8, there are four general findings and 13 review factors that must be addressed in order to grant a use permit. I will now review those. The findings and review factors are identified in the staff report, attachment three, and is within the application in attachment three eight. The four findings that are that the proposed use is one, in harmony with the area and not substantially injurious to the value of properties in the general vicinity, two, in conformance with all special requirements applicable to the use, three, will not adversely affect the health or safety of the public, and four, will adequately address the review factors identified below. 
The 13 review factors must address how the development manages, one, circulation, parking, and loading, ser services, entrance, and areas, lighting, signs, utilities, open spaces, environmental protection, screening, buffering, and landscaping, any effect on adjacent property, including but not limited to noise, odor, lighting, and traffic, compatibility, consistency with policy, and any other factors deemed by the Unified Development Ordinance. Staff has analyzed the application and finds that most of the review factors uh, mentioned above are met and are in accordance with compliance based upon the site plan submitted. However, the applicant must also show how the proposed development does not adversely affect adjacent property in regards to value, noise, odor, and traffic, and is compatible with the property, with the compatible property with the area. Staff does not anticipate noise will be created by the university or college use. A noise analysis is not required to be provided by the applicant for a major special use permit. However, the site will be required to be in compliance with the City of Durham noise ordinance. Regarding traffic, the proposed use does not require a traffic impact analysis, or TIA, as the number of trips to this site will not generate more than the threshold 149 peak hour trips. However, a TIA was completed for this site and several other proposed university projects in a lump, um, in a lumped project in October of 2018. There is a potential for decrease in traffic um, located on the site as the existing 228 space parking lot will be demolished and there will instead be 110 parking spaces provided for this site. A bus stop to the south of the site will potentially increase bus traffic. Odor is not anticipated to be generated from this use type. Lighting for the site is in compliance with UDO section 7.4 and has been proposed by the applicant to face downward to minimize any effects on the surrounding residential properties. Some lighting will be located interior to the campus and face the other <coughs> university buildings. A required landscaped transitional use area, sometimes referred to as TUA, buffer and vehicular use area or otherwise known as VUA, plantings between the parking lot and the residential uses are provided along the adjacent property to the east and along the south side of the parking lot facing the residential properties across Cecil Street in an effort to lessen any visual or noise impacts of the parking lot on these properties. A landscaped project boundary buffer, street trees, and the width of Cecil Street lessens the visual impact of the building on the residential parcels to the south, as street trees and the wider width of Fayetteville Street lessen the, the impact on the residential parcels to the west of the proposed student center. The applicant must demonstrate how the use is compatible with the nearby properties. Staff recognizes that the proposed development will be adjacent to both university and residential properties. The applicant has taken several measures in landscaping, buffering, lighting, and overall site design for the least possible impact on the adjacent properties. And lastly, the scale and design of the proposed building is designed to lessen the visual impact on the residential properties while remaining consistent with the rest of the adjacent campus. The applicant must provide evidence to demonstrate that the findings and review factors are being met. If the governing body fails to find conformance with the conditions and factors previously mentioned, then the proposed permit must be denied. However, if the applicant provides evidence that demonstrates the findings and review factors are being met, the governing body must approve the use permit. Planning staff will make a recommendation for the use permit prior to the vote on the public hearing after all evidence has been presented. Staff is also available for any questions related to the permit request throughout this time. If there are currently no questions for the planning staff at this time, I will now turn the flow over to the applicant to present their case. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Uh, I'll first ask, are there any questions for city staff uh, from the council or any party? Any questions at this point for the city staff? Mr. Mayor, I do have a question. I might. It, will the staff's recommendation be based upon anything substantive that happens in this hearing, or has the staff already arrived at that and as a matter of form just can't release that until we're... Staff recommendation will happen after the hearing, and it will be based upon the, the material submitted as well as what is discussed today within the hearing. And you'll do that on the spot tonight? That is correct, after uh, all evidence has been presented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Mr. Mayor, just an additional question. Are there any other universities that would face this type of um, hearing, quasi-judicial hearing, in order to do land use zoning? 
And then um, so I cannot uh, speak to what other universities are planning at this time. Essentially, the use permit is required because a portion of the site, about half of the site, is zoned residential. And in order to build a, re a university or college use within a residential zoning district, a use permit is required. Um, in this case, a major special use permit. Um, so I can't speak to whether that situation is within other universities. But if it is there, they would have to do this exact same process. Pat Young. Yeah. <laughs> Um, of course, Ms. Monroe's uh, answer is correct, but I did want to add that the um, the reason this is being required, as Ms. Monroe alluded to briefly in her earlier comments, is because the development is being proposed in a residential zoning district. So we have one other university in town, Duke University, that has this UC zoning, and they would be subject to these same standards they were proposing development in a, in a residential zoning district. So that is a, a comparable treatment. <laughs> is it? Is there any of the North Carolina Central University campus in a UC zoning district? Or yes, is it all? Um, half of this actual site, only 1.48 acres of the total 8.99 is residentially zoned. Okay. Um, so majority of the campus at Central does have the UC or University College dash two zoning distinction. Okay. All right. Any more questions for staff at this point? Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Thank and you. now we will hear from the applicant. Good evening, members of council. Bill Bryan again, Morningstar Law Group with my colleague, Neil Ghosh. I'm here to uh, represent uh, NC Central. <clears throat> we are requesting uh, the in, in support of its application for a major special use permit to allow a new student center to be built on property, which is zoned RU-52. Uh, we're also requesting that you uh, approve a major site plan, which is associated with this use, which has been fully reviewed and approved by your staff, subject only to your final approval tonight. Um, Mr. Ghosh has a packet of exhibits that he will hand up to the one of the attorneys. Don't you need to review it? I believe the attorney needs to uh, review this first, Madam Clerk. No, needs to go to Miss River. We got it. <laughs> it's getting worked The uh, packet includes the um, an, a couple of, uh, of of exhibits that will be referred to by our witnesses during the course of the hearing as well as um, the expert, uh, the uh, curricula vitae of the expert uh, witnesses that we're going to offer this evening. Um, and and the, I'd like to enter into evidence the resumes of Mr. Jay Smith, the head planner and land planner from O'Brien Atkins, Mr. Jarvis Martin, a certified real estate appraiser and longtime re resident, and Ms. Dion Brown of Davenport, who prepared both the traffic and the parking studies for these case for this case. We would like to tender each of these witnesses as experts as they come forward and, and uh, to give t opinion to testimony pursuant to the requirements of NCGS 160A 393K. So the project, uh, NCCU is in the process of redeveloping parts of its campus in order to modernize it and ensure that NCCU will continue to be the outstanding institution of higher learning. It always has been and also continue in its role as a vital catalyst for community economic development. This project is for the development of a new student center that will replace the existing student union, which is located to the north of the site where the new student center will be built. It may seem odd that a special use permit on which, the, uh, on which the student center, excuse me, it may seem odd to you that a special use permit is necessary uh, for a student center on a university campus, but as has been explained by the staff, um, the underlying zoning in this case mandates it. A portion of the property, one and about, about one and a half acres of a total of around nine acres of land, is zoned RU5-2 rather than UC2. Uh, if it were all zoned UC2, it would not require a special use permit, but because it's zoned RU5, it is required. So, based on the fast construction schedule the university has undertaken in order to give its students first-rate facilities quickly, uh, NCCU has opted to pursue the major special use permit now. Um, now, with regard to process, as you know, special uses are uses which are permitted within the district, provided that the specific proposal meets certain standards. It is a quasi-judicial hearing in which the city council acts as its own board of adjustment. In a quasi-judicial case, the council must rely only upon the competent material and substantial evidence that is entered into the record at the hearing. As a result, for each finding which you must make and for which the applicant has put on sufficient evidence, 
The deciding body must find in favor of the applicant if no competent material substantial evidence to the contrary is offered at the hearing. And importantly, the only issues before you tonight are those which relate specifically to the standards for a major special use permit for the student center. Issues for folks in the neighborhood who may have problems with NCCU over other matters uh, which do not relate directly to the proposed student center are not competent evidence and should be excluded from the record. And I have to say, during this process, I may object to things that people say. I may object a lot. <laughs> I may object a little, but, um, and I may ask that you rule certain testimony inadmissible. Um, it's not, it's nothing personal, and I'm not trying to do it to disrupt the flow of the evidence, but we do have to protect the record uh, in case there's an appeal. So this is very different than a legislative setting in which people can just come up and talk about any, just about anything they want to. Um, it has to relate specifically to the student center and to the, and to the factors and the findings that have to be made pursuant to the ordinance. So we have a number of standards that we have to meet, as the staff has just pointed out to you. In order to do that, we have our uh, three expert witnesses who are going to testify. And I'm going to call them up here one by one. And at the close of the case, I'm going to summarize the evidence we provided for each of the applicable standards. Um, now, did, uh, Madam Attorney, did we get a ruling on the uh, proposed exhibits? Yeah, see, the exhibits have been. They're proved evidence. All right, thank you very much. Our first witness this evening will be Mr. Jay Smith with Brian Atkins, who has overseen the development of the project before you tonight. Good evening. Good evening. I am, excuse me. Good evening. I am Jay Smith with O'Brien Atkins. My resume is Exhibit A in the notebook. Our firm was engaged to prepare the site plan, which is before you, and I have been overseeing that site design. MSUP factors. First, Harmony. The site is north of Cecil, east of Fayetteville, and south of Nelson, in the southwest corner of North Carolina Central's campus. NCCU's campus is part of the fabric of this local community. Its edges have been built to coexist with the residential communities which surround it, and this project is no different. It specifically has been designed to meld with the surrounding neighborhood. The massing and location of the building respects the traditional use areas so that the bulk of the structure is set back from any residential uses. Moreover, vehicular use areas will be appropriately buffered from adjacent residential areas to further minimize the visual impact of this project that this project will have. Just as the campus and the existing student center have coexisted in harmony with the surrounding community for many years, this new student center specifically is designed to both preserve and even increase that successful coexistence. Accordingly, it is my professional opinion that the proposed use and design before you will be in harmony with the neighboring community and, of course, with the campus itself, in accordance with UDO Section 3.9.8A, Section 1. On to special factors. Section 3.9.A, 8A, 2 requires the use of the conformance use be in conformance with any special requirements applicable to the use. The UDO does not prescribe any limited standards which apply to the student center use. That having been said, I did want to touch briefly on the transitional use area as it relates to height. Our site design is consistent with the UDO's height requirement and all other requirements. The property is split zoned so the application of some of the standard UDO provisions is a little convoluted. A 75 foot wide transitional use area is required from the edge of the UC2 district. In this case, the planning director made a determination that this transitional use area would be applied from the edge of the right of way for Cecil as because that street is the UC district boundary. The transitional use area relegates height as a function of setback at a one-to-one -one ratio. So within the TUA, building height is increased one foot for every additional foot of setback. This provides more compatible massing 
at the edge of the UC district, literally a transitional area. This project complies with the height restrictions established in the TUA, as noted by the staff. Next, I'd like to talk to you about health and safety. Section 3.9.8A3 of the UDO is aimed at ensuring that the project does not adversely affect health and safety. One of the student center's primary missions is to promote good health amongst the university's students. Currently, the plan includes provisions for counseling and career services, a women's center, a multi-ethnic center, and an LBGBTA center, among other services. Aside from promoting the health of the student body, the student center has been designed with safety in mind. Currently, the area in which the student center is proposed contains nine individual driveway cuts on Cecil Street. Each of these driveway cuts represents a possible point of conflict with opposing traffic. The design of the new student center will reduce the number of driveway cuts from nine to three, a significant improvement. In my professional opinion, the proposed use and the design help ensure, helps ensure the safety, health and safety of the public will meet the requirements of section 3.9.8A3. Now, on to review factors. Section 3.9.8A4 and 3.9.8B outline the 13 review factors which we must meet. The first subsection deals with circulation. As shown on the site plan that you have in front of you, the design of the student center is meant to prom promote multimodal transportation options. 22 bicycle parking spaces are provided to promote bicycle ridership. The site will continue the campus's internal sidewalk network so that it is easily accessible to the rest of the campus by foot. There is, of course, provisions for tra vehicular traffic. The parking lot associated with this use is accessible from two points on Cecil Street and one off Nelson Street. The project also includes a direct vehicular connection between Cecil and Nelson. This direct connection is critical in improving the circulation on this part of the campus. Without it, the only connections in this area between the two streets are Fayetteville and Lincoln. By creating a third mid-block throughway, emergency response time in this area will be in improved as well as general circulation. The second subsection deals with parking and loading. Our representative from Davator, Davenport will speak more um, about parking, but suffice it to say that adequate parking is provided on site for the student center. Additionally, loading areas have been designed to allow pass-by traffic while loading is in progress. Service entrances and areas are addressed by, third, by the third subsection. Our service entrance will be from Cecil Street by the new connection out of Nelson. From, excuse me, the service area is tucked under the building's overhang and is hidden from view from the public right-of-way. Subsection four addresses the lighting plan for, for the site, which is shown on page E1002 of the site plan. This demonstrates compliance with the UDO requirements for lighting. The fifth subsection addresses signage. Aside from the signage required for handicap parking and the bus stop, neither the use permit nor the site plan contemplates additional signage at this time. Should signage be sought in the future, the UDO requirements requires a separate approval process, which NCCU will then follow. Subsection six deals with utilities. Utilities are all on site already However, existing connections will be removed and replaced with new electrical, water, and sewer connections. Subsection 7 addresses open space. The UDO requires 3% of the gross area of the residentially zoned area on the site to be open space. This equals 1,934.1 square feet. At 5,361.5 square feet, this plan provides more than twice the amount of required open space. 
Subsection 8 deals with the environmental protection. There are no environmentally sensitive features on the property. There is a 3% tree coverage requirement for the residentially zoned portion of the site. We are providing 3.18% tree coverage, and therefore we meet this requirement. Regarding subsection 9, the site plan shows that the required landscaping and buffering will be provided. This includes street trees around the site, parking lot landscaping, and the UDO required 20-foot wide buffer in the TUA between the residential properties and the vehicular use areas. Subsection 10 addresses effects on adjacent properties. Properties adjacent to the site are either part of the campus or are residential. We have other experts who will speak to property values and traffic. For my part, I believe that the reinvestment in this area will have a positive impact in the community. For years, NCCU and its neighbors have worked together to uphold one another. The design itself is well screened from residential uses by landscaping, therefore reducing any visual impacts. Also, the Student Center serves as a resource for the student body rather than a venue for public events, such as a stadium. Therefore, the use will not create unusual noises, odors, or traffic. Subsection 11 addresses the ground, excuse me, the general level of compatibility of the proposed student center with nearby properties. As has been mentioned in the residential properties near the campus have coexisted with the existing student center and the other activities on the campus for quite some time. The proposed student center is an expanse, is an expansion which will create a more uniform southwestern edge of the campus. The scale and design of the student center is consistent with other buildings in the southwestern portion of the campus. The bulk of the building has been set back from the property lines to create distance between it and the residential areas. Therefore, both the use and its design are compatible with nearby properties. Finally, it is my professional opinion that the proposed use is consistent with the policies contained in the comprehensive plan for the location and establishment of non-residential uses in residential zones it is required by subsection 12, as it is required by subsection 12. The design respects the residential surroundings while providing NCCU students with a modern student center to help them maintain a high level of achievement. Conclusion. If you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Our next witness will be Dion Brown, our traffic engineer from Davenport. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Smith. Smith. I'm going to now uh, turn this over to our uh, city attorney. Before you leave the lectern, please, Mr. Smith. Um, Mr. Bryan, I gather that by tendering uh, Exhibit A with uh, Mr. Smith's qualifications and expertise that you are tendering him as an expert, correct? Yes, ma'am. I, as I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks, we're tendering all of these witnesses as experts. Okay. I think for clarity on the record, if we could tender each one as they approach to testify all right. and allow the mayor to accept them as an expert, that will give us a cleaner record. Okay. Do you so do, for the purposes of Mr. Smith's them, testimony? Do you want me to ask them to talk about their qualifications first? Or can no, 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 no. We can, we can use the exhibit. We've already, the council has already reviewed and accepted the exhibit. I just want to make clear that... That each is being tendered. Oh, that's fine. Correct. All right. And so uh, thank you, Mr. Smith, for your testimony. I'm going to let the mayor officially accept you as an expert, and then we can get to questions. Thank you, Madam Attorney, for your guidance, and we do accept you as an expert witness, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask council members or uh, any opposing party, are there any questions for this witness? Any questions for this witness? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Bryan. Uh, yes, thank you. Our, our next witness will be Ms. Dion Brown from Davenport, and we are tendering Ms. Brown as an expert witness in traffic and parking. Thank you very much. Uh, we have received uh, uh, Exhibit C. No, I'm sorry, it's C. Exhibit B. I believe Ms. B is That's Mr. C. Martin. I believe the... Uh, C. Exhibit C, uh, and I accept uh, Ms. Brown as an expert witness. Welcome. 
Good evening, my name is Dion Brown. I'm a project manager with Davenport and a professional engineer. My resume and both reports are in Exhibit C. Please let me know if you have any questions about my qualifications as a traffic engineer. Our firm was engaged to assess the traffic <coughs> impacts of the new student center. Our firm reviewed both the traffic and the parking impacts related to the development of the new student center as well as a variety of other projects that are being built on campus. Both reports have been reviewed and approved by the City of Durham. The traffic study was completed in October of last year. The study took into account several different planned developments on Central's campus. The study assumed that 417 existing dorm rooms would be demolished, 823 new dorm rooms would be added, up to 7,500 square feet of retail would be added. A 71,000 square foot school of business will be replaced. Will we replace the existing 3,000 or 38,600 square feet building? And that the new 104,100 square feet student center will be replacing the 39,000. 600 square foot center. We studied the impact of these improvements um, would have on the 12 intersections near NCCU campus. Ultimately, we found that the delays at the majority of the study intersections would increase only slightly. Therefore, no improvements were recommended at those intersections. Improvements were recommended at the intersections of South Austin Avenue at Lawson Street and at South Austin Avenue and at Cecil. In both cases, the recommended improvements was adjusting signal timings and signal like, uh, cycle lanes and optimizing signal timings. Only one of those improvements, the signal timing at Austin and Cecil is implicated um, by the proposed student center. With that improvement, it is my professional opinion that the traffic reasonably ex expected to be generated by the new student center will be mitigated and there will be no adverse impacts to the adjacent areas. Moreover, I want to note that the design of the new student center replaces the existing um, 288 space surface parking lot with the 110 space parking lot. <coughs> this reduction is available parking will result in fewer vehicular traffic to and from the southwest quadrant of NCCU campus. So the proposed student center and its design should significantly reduce the number of trips to and from this part of campus. Reducing the number of trips should accordingly reduce the amount of traffic congestion in this area. In the parking study, during this time that the student center is under construction, the parking demand is expected to increase only slightly mostly as a result of growth to the student enrollment and faculty. For our study, we analyzed the university's enrollment and em employment data to determine the growth rates of student and staff. We found that the student body grows at about 1.1% each year and that the staff grows about 1% each year. We also were able to extrapolate <coughs> the effect of peak hour um, parking demand for resident students, commuting students, and faculty using counts and parking data, permit data. Over the two year period in which the new student center is expected to be built and put online, the increase of parking demand is estimated to be 108 spaces. Given the current excess parking capacity, it is my professional opinion that there is adequate parking on campus to accommodate the university's total parking demand both during and after construction of the new student center. Mm -hmm. And at this time, you can bring that. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Uh, yeah, Ms. Brown, maybe I, I can ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Um, when you uh, did your traffic study, did you look at the entire campus? Yes. Uh, for your parking study, is that correct? That's correct. And how many parking spaces were there at the time that you looked at? 
2,702 parking spaces were controlled by NCCU. And what was the demand? The demand was 2,043 spaces, which, okay. which means that 659 spaces are unoccupied at peak um, parking demand times. So does that mean that, this, that the parking on NC Central's campus is underutilized? Correct. Okay. Um, now the Student Center is going to remove 333 parking spaces and replace it with 110 spaces. Is that correct? Correct. And so that's going to be a net loss of 223 parking spaces, right? Yes. So where does that leave, how does that affect parking capacity in this area? Um, this leaves the excess parking capacity over current um, peak demand of 326 spaces. Now, and that's during construction, right? Yes. And then after construction? Um, they'll have an access of over uh, current parking demand of 436 spaces. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's about all we need to cover. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Ms. Brown, if you could ha stay there for a minute. Uh, are there any questions by members of the council for Ms. Brown? Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have one question about uh, one of the intersections that you studied, South Alston Avenue and Dupree Street. In your description, you mentioned that with the planned commitment of the Durham Orange Light Rail, the intersection will be redirected into a right-in, right-out as part of your justification for recommending no improvements at that intersection. Um, with the discontinuation of the light rail, does that change, um, you know, it seems like that would, ch that, that changes one of the factors, does that change your overall recommendation? Does it? Um, well, right now we are actually in um, coordination with the city of Durham to revise for that portion, portion of the northern campus for school of business and that wouldn't affect the um, student center let me let me ask a question to clarify your your question I think, yeah for her. does the, the the intersection that she's that uh, mayor pro tem is referring to does that in any way relate to the student center no no oh okay so it's not related this is and I it is a, a bit confusing we found it a bit confusing too the the parking study is for the entire campus the traffic studies for the entire campus and it takes into account all these different projects. This permit tonight is only for the student center. And so you have to hone down in the part in the traffic study to the part that deals just specifically with the student center. And does does the intersection that the councilwoman was referring to have is that affected in any way by the student center that is the subject of the major special use permit application tonight? No. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. The the thing that I think is confusing in light of that is that it gives a future no build condition and a future build condition. So what is anticipated to be built in that future build condition if not the student center? The, Go ahead. the future build is and taking account for the student center, the school, um, school of business and the new dorms on campus. Okay. So it gives you apples to apples of what it will be like that year if nothing was built and then at that year when everything is built okay so it so it's not that it has nothing to do with the student center it's that it's the student center and other buildings as well that would all impact this intersection yes okay well and i would specifically to follow up on that question if it was just the student center being built would this intersection be impacted by the by traffic anticipated to be generated by the student center debris no no Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you. Any other council members? Yes. Council Member Freeman. I, I just wanted um, to clarify, the traffic study does include off street or on street parking as well, like on Cecil Street? No, if it's not owned by the, the campus, it's not. So you're only accounting for the, the parking slots on campus? Correct. Not for anything off campus? No. Okay, and then second, I wanted to note so you're noting that um, in the signal, signalized intersection of South Austin Avenue and Cecil Street, your, your note says that the cycle length would be changed. Are you saying that there'll be no impact if the cycle's changed or if it's, is no impact either way? There is no impact to that intersection. Um, the recommendation was to coordinate to the signal to the north 
at Lawson, which would have the most delay. So if it's not coordinated? It will still function. Okay. That's okay. Nonetheless, I think it would be appropriate, uh, Councilman Wolf, if you would like to make that a condition to, to coordinate the signals. That I would like to make it a condition, condition to. Uh, I mean, I wasn't the testimony, I don't know if this is given the testimony that you heard. Any other questions for the witness from members of the council? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, and thank you, <clears throat> Ms. Brown. The are all of the parking spaces on Central's campus unrestricted as to who can park there? Um, they have certain um, parking spaces for staff and faculty, and then they also have it for students. So the difference you cited between available spots and the usage, are, are you suggesting that it would mitigate uh, any, any um, um, inconveniences caused by the building of the center if, if, if you can't park in every spot, if it's not open to everyone? Are you certain that the uh, the the point that you've made in terms of uh, the underuse underutilization of parking would actually mitigate that issue? Yes, they have an underutilized parking deck on campus. That's available to everyone. Yes. Okay. Right. Thank you, Thank Council you. Member. Any other questions by members of the council? Ms. Monroe, are you there because you have some remarks to make? Um, uh, just a clarifying uh, question um, for Mrs. Brown. Uh, essentially, when your parking study was done. The proposed student center was 104,000, um, 104,100 square feet. Um, the current building is proposed at 105,000 square feet. I just wanted to, for the record, um, have on record whether or not, in your expert opinion, that discrepancy of 900 square feet would change anything within your report. It would not change that much. It would probably maybe two or three trips extra. That was all from staff. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of the council for Ms. Brown? Are there any opponents who would like to question Ms. Brown at this time? Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Oh, I'm sorry, we have some. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't uh, see you. Could you please come to this microphone over here? And sir, uh, could you please state your name and let me know whether or not you have signed up on this uh, Sign up sheet. Okay. My name is Ronald McCoy. I live in the neighborhood that we're talking about, and that's one of the reasons I'm here today. And I see your name here on the sheet, Mr. McCoy. Thank you. First, to start off, I want to say that one of the basic things to do anything, to build any building, to do any structure, is the planning. Uh, objection, uh, Mr. Mayor. Does Mr. McCoy have a question, or is he going to make a speech? I have a question. Please, sir, please ask a question, sir. First? You want me to question Ms. Brown now? That is what you are supposed to do, sir. Mr. Okay. McCoy. Ms. Brown. Mr. McCoy, okay, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to have to sustain that objection. This is, uh, okay. We have to run this as a quasi-judicial hearing, Brown. so please ask your question. Thank okay. you. Ms. Brown, you spoke about the parking on campus. North Carolina Central does not have any parking other than the dead. There are places on campus to park, but they don't have that many spaces. One of the problems in the neighborhood that we are really here for is the traffic and the parking. There's, if there were parking, if there was ample parking at North Carolina Central, uh, people sorry, wouldn't Mr. park Mayor, down by-, by we, we, we object. We object. Mr. Mr. Sir, can Mr. I finish speaking, please? I'm Mr. sorry, you're, Mr. McCoy. I have to object, Mr. McCoy. Mr. McCoy. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to sustain that objection. I understand that you have opinions on these things, but oh, sir, this is not can you, opinion. Can you please? He ask, stated a fact concerning parking on Central Campus. Well, what is your question for Ms. Brown? My question to her: She has probably not even been on Central Campus and looked at the parking. North Carolina Central has had a parking problem for the last ten years. Mr. Objection, McCoy. Mr. Mr. McCoy. I'm going to have to ask you. So here's an example. You could ask her: Has she been on campus? You could ask her if she's aware of the parking problem. Try to think about the questions that you want to ask her that will make the point that you'd like to make. My question. Thank you very much, sir, and yes, I'm sir. sorry about that. My question to her is, how often have you been on the campus of North Carolina Central during the time the school is in session? Um, this particular month, I've been on campus twice. School is not in session this month. Right. I said when school, when school is in session. In okay. session 
Let me turn to people notes. Um, during this study in particular, I've been on campus at least five times. If there were ample parking on campus, why would people park off campus? If you, if you say that. there's additional parking, and, and right now you're saying they're going to be, you know, we have enough parking, even building the, uh, uh, the new building, that there's going to be ample parking on campus. And my question to you, if, if there was ample parking on, on campus and you, and you really have studied it, you would have known that there's not ample parking on campus. Objection, Central. Mr. Mayor. I understand your objection, Mr. McCoy. You asked a question. Maybe you could repeat that question about parking, uh, adequate parking in Central. Can you, let me just explain to you, Mr. McCoy. I'm trying to be helpful here. Please. I understand that you're trying to make a point, and, but this is not a time for argumentation but it is a time for questioning. So if you want, for example, to ask it's not Ms. Brown, um, does, she, does she believe there's ample parking on the campus? And questions like that, that would be appropriate. Ms. Brown, in your professional opinion, do you actually think Central, do you not believe Central has a parking problem? Central has Apple, um, ample parking on campus between their lots and their parking deck to accommodate what they have um, population-wise right now. Well, to verify this, I would really ask the council members during school time to ride to North Carolina Central and verify what she's saying. It, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. It is, are these, I have to ask, are these questions being directed to the student center, or are they being directed to a, a more generic North no, Carolina? No, my Central questions issue? are towards the planning of parking. That she said there's ample parking, Mr. Uh, Mr. On campus, the, Mr. The Mr. Ryan, I'm going to I'm going to answer your question. Yes, sir. I believe that the questions that Mr. McCoy is asking are reasonably associated with the student center. Uh, I understand your concern, but I also understand that Mr. McCoy is uh, in right to uh, ask if. Uh, if the if the construction of the new student center, uh, if these if this if, if the the total parking situation uh, that the that the construction of the new student center is relevant to that, so I'm going to permit that question. And but Mr. McCoy, I want to stress again, you have to put your state your the points that you want to make in the form of a question. question. I'm not used to it either, Mr. McCoy. I'm not a lawyer. I haven't done it before. I get your confusion, but this is the process. I've been advised here by our city attorney, and, uh, and I know she knows how to do this. So if you want to make a point, please put your point in the form of a question to Ms. Brown, and the council will then will be making our judgment uh, as to whether or not they've met the requirements. Here again, I state to Ms. Brown. Yes. Number one, have you, when is the last time you've been on campus doing school? to verify this information you provided? I get it. And do you have documentation? Could we, could I see documentation that you have developed or you have obtained stating the number of cars that are registered at North Carolina Central and the number of parking spaces? Uh, the answer to the second question. I'm sorry, I can't recall the last time I've been on campus. Um, during this time. The question is, in, in, re, in relationship to the number of students that are paid for parking permission on North Carolina Central's campus, are there adequate parking spaces for that number of students? For those that pay, yes. Mr. McCoy, do you have other questions? Uh, I do have questions and concerns, sir, but they're not concerning uh, the parking. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCoy. Okay, thank Appreciate you very it. much. Thank you very much. Are there any other uh, p people in opposition who would like to question the witness? Yes, sir. Sir, could you state your name? Of course. Uh, my name is Richard Kelly. And Mr. Kelly, I see your name is on this list as well. Yes, thank you. Um, Ms. Brown, um, of the parking spaces that are available, how many of them are free of charge? 
Yeah. How, how many of those have do not have fees associated with them? None that you know. None, none that I know of. Can we pull mm -hmm. somewhere from? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the answer would be none, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, another question. The number of parking spaces is being reduced from 288 to 110. And I understand that the traffic flow analysis you did was for peak times. Yes. Um, the new student center actually can accommodate up to 1,100 students in its auditorium. Um, so is it your assertion that there is adequate parking for off-peak times where you have special events at in the auditorium and then on the green space outside of the auditorium, which actually can hold a much larger volume of people. Yes, there will be adequate parking on the campus of NCCU. Free of charge. That is up to the, the, the school. We would, uh, I have another witness who was not planning to speak, but she's here to speak uh, and it has a believed been sworn, is that correct? Yes. Uh, who can answer the question about how much free parking is available, if that's a... Yeah, Mr. Bryan, I'm sorry, did, is this witness uh, already signed this list right here? She did. And is she, uh, are you presenting her as an expert witness, Mr. Bryan? No, we're presenting her as a fact witness because the questions that are being asked are factual. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, uh, please come up and identify yourself, and uh, then we'll ask you, Mr. Kelly, to ask your question again. Um, let's let's let her identify herself first. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Akua Matherson. I'm associate vice chancellor for administration and finance at North Carolina Central University. Okay. Um, as I previously asked, there's the number of parking spaces in the vicinity of the student center was reduced from 288 to 110, mm -hmm. um, with the capacity of the auditorium at 1,100 people, and the green space outside of the student center accommodating a lot, much larger group of people, which we were informed that there would be events held in that green space. Um, are you saying that there would be adequate free parking for any of these special events that occurred uh, in that student center that would be accommodated by NC NCCU? So our current, the answer is yes. Our current policy, which would continue um, even with the new student center, is that when we are having planned special events, that our parking lots are opened up um, the information is shared with our police and public safety and also with our transportation and parking coordinators. And we, are, we allow um, people to come in with their cars that are, don't have a typical student, faculty, and staff permit. So you could never like, imagine a circumstance where you had have a special event in the auditorium during peak hours that would, again, overflow the amount of parking that's available on campus. So since we already have an excess of uh, parking during peak hours, even if we were during a peak period, we still would have enough parking uh, based on the studies that we've done to accommodate those people who would come on campus who would be um, not already students, faculty, or staff. Um, a lot of our special events that would occur would have students, faculty, and staff coming to them who would already be parked in other places on campus, allowing the, uh, I think it was 423 excess spaces to be used by those who are not already on campus. Um, additionally, was the parking study made available to the residents in proximity to the student center? <laughs> Record with the city. This is Frank Kamenya. The wait, 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 wait. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the, the parking study was submitted to the city. Uh, it was a, it's been a public record, and it's been a public record for uh, well over a year. Am I correct about that? Yes. So the parking study has been available to, the, to every resident of the city as a public document for over a year. So were the residents, again, within a proximity of the university notified that that parking study had been completed? <laughs> the answer is no. Right? The answer is no. No, they were not, but they didn't have to be. And frankly, I, we're, we're veering again, Madam Attorney, into way off the, 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 uh, the uh, issue that's before us here tonight, which is whether or not, which, which relates to the major special use permit requirements for the uh, um, student center. And so I'd, I'd request that we curtail this line of questioning. May I respond to that? Um, remember, you need to confine your inquiry to the specific okay, yes. criteria. So during the rezoning listening session, 
that the residents were notified at. See, I, I object to that as well. This isn't a rezoning hearing. I didn't ask it. I didn't say it was. I said in reference to the rezoning session that we were invited, the residents were invited to. Same um, objection. Is, is, are you, is your question relating to the major special use permit or to the rezoning? To the, to the uh, major, major special use permit. So what's your question regarding the major special use permit? Um, we were told that the parking study, as it related to the new student center, would be made available to us, and it was not at that meeting. What's your, what's your question, Mr. Kelly? So, um, I guess that wasn't, though. Okay. I think, I think that, again, as part of the process, um, I think something that impacts their, their residents. Um, do you expect that that something like a parking study or traffic flow analysis or those types of things would be relevant for the residents to be actually prepared to come to a meeting like this? Objection, Mr. Mayor. The the materials were submitted to the staff. They're part of the staff report and. And it's not it's not a relevant issue to be brought up in, in the context of this hearing. All all public notices were taken care of in, in accordance with. I understood, but I don't think that, that he was asking about in the major special use permit. Would would you think that that would be? Uh, I can't remember his exact phrasing. Use of a piece of information. Well, Mr. Mayor, again, I, although I appreciate your, it's certainly relevant information, but it is not information which is re required by the city. In effect, has made a finding that it is not necessary to give it to the adjoining property owners. It's necessary to give it to the city, and then it's up to the city to, to disseminate it to people who ask for it in accordance with the notice provisions set forth in state law as well as in the local ordinances. And so it's not the applicant's burden to, to, make, to, to make that kind of a, to do that type of uh, outreach. In fact, it would probably be improper to do it in a quasi-judicial yes. proceeding. I appreciate your comments. Sounds like you answered his question. Yes, Mr. Kelly? You. Thank you. Any others? No, I'm good. Thank you. Um, any council member have any questions for Ms. Brown? I, I do. Um, I actually wanted to know if there was a construction plan in place for uh, parking uh, prior to, uh, I mean, if there was a plan put together prior to pulling this um, permit. Because I heard there were some changes made, or there to, were to whom are you asking that question? Me or or or, uh, the, or the witness? The witness mentioned it, but I know you're at the mic. So. No, I'm, so, I'm sorry. What what construction? So you mentioned that you there was a parking change, and there I'm sorry, it was during your testimony. So I I wasn't keeping up exactly, but you mentioned that because there was because the I'm sorry, or maybe I read it. The building that came online early, there's a nursing school business or nursing school parking lot that will not be able to be used during construction. I'm assuming you have a plan already in place. There, go ahead. Go ahead. There is a parking um, plan in place, um, and we have submitted to the city and to um, Central to implement it. You want to add to that? Mm -hmm. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Okay, Akua Matheson, North Carolina Central University. So um, as we're preparing for the construction, we did implement a temporary parking plan that reassigns uh, spaces in where people are to park during the construction period. And that is for permitted parking only, not for free no, parking? No, that's for all parking. Okay. Other and, questions? And is that plan, that's the plan you turned over to staff that should be made available to the public as well? Um, that's an internal plan that we are using through the construction. The parking plan that I think Davenport mentioned is the uh, permanent file that's gone to the, st to the city. How do you intend to make that internal plan available to the public? Um, I guess I don't know the answer to that because that's a temporary I'll, I'll, plan. I'll object to the record. For the record, I, I, don't, it, I don't think this is relates to the major special use permit. However, I will, do you, do you want to answer that question? Just 
if, it, if we need to make it available, we can certainly make it available. But and it, it I just want to make sure that the relevancy to the question is, uh, is, is stated in that if you're planning to do construction within the city limits and a plan has been made around how you're going to address your parking on site, it would be great for the city to know what that is. And that's absolutely relevant to the question of the, of the building permits. It's not necessarily relevant to the major special use permit, but I understand. And we don't, I'm, I don't mean to be argumentative. I'm, you are argumentative, Mr. Bryan, but that's okay. We know that's part I, of your character. I like arguing. And your Mr. profession, Bryan. We're, we're going with it. Okay, yes, sir, Mr. Kelly, I believe you may have another question. Mr. Mayor, could I just make an observation real quick, and maybe the city attorney can help me with this. Um, I can be fine procedurally with um, the proponents tagging in an additional witness to which the question was not addressed. Theoretically, I could be okay with that. What I think has, but I think council has veered a couple of moments toward answering the questions for the witnesses. Um, and I don't think that's something that ought to be happening. If there's an objection, great, let's work it out. But um, let's try not to have attorneys answering the questions asked by members of the council or by uh, the opponents. I think that'll make things a little cleaner for everybody. That would certainly be the better practice, Councilman Reese. And it would also be a, a good practice because we have fact witnesses alternating with expert witnesses. Certainly. I know it gets tedious, but just to identify yourself before you right. begin speaking. I appreciate those clarifications, and I'll try to uh, help keep that sorted out. Mr. Kelly? Yes, uh, Richard Kelly, I have one additional question. Um, in relation to the 288 parking spaces that are re being reduced to 110 during peak hours, which are paid parking places, what percentage of of NC Central's staff and students actually pay for parking? Akua Matheson, North Carolina Central University. I do not have that information with me um, right now in terms of the total percentage of students, faculty, and staff that have uh, paid permits. I can provide, I can get that information, but I don't have it with me. I don't know if, if you all have it as a part of your study. Ms. Brown, do you have any information that you can offer on that? My name is Dan Brown. Um, we have a total faculty staff at fall of 2018, um, 1,424. Um, I, I see how many paid. I don't see pay parking though. That's the number of parking that three and four five. Yeah. yeah, but that's, I don't have how many actually have a paid parking space though, but I just have the total number of staff. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Are there any more questions for this witness? Yes. Mr. Mayor, I believe Ms. Riley has. I'm her sorry. Hand. Can I go back? I believe mm. Ms. Riley has her hand up. Yes, you may, Ms. Brown. I'm sorry. Um, the parking sales for the base year was 879. 879 what? Staff, faculty and staff. Okay, thank you. Ms. Riley? Please identify yourself. Good evening, my name's Jillian Riley. I live on Cecil Street. Um, Ms. Brown, I was wondering if you had um, if you knew the number of student, faculty, staff, and employees that drove to campus every day. Not every day, but we have taken the counts on um, August 24th at that time that we did the traffic or the um, parking study. So it counted the cars that were there. And that includes both paid permit parking and unpaid? Whoever was on campus at that time, yes. So, for, so only for on-campus parking, correct. correct? We don't do off-campus. OK, so if a student is, is driving but it's not parked on campus, then you did not count them? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riley. Any other questions for Ms. Brown? Just, just a clarifying question. If I could ask our city attorney, would a matter like parking be um, a review factor around circulation 
is recognizing that it's around access points in the property, um, proposed structures, uses, in particular reference, uh, automobile, motorcycles, mass transit, pedestrian safety, convenience traffic flow, control, and access in case of fire? I think probably, I don't know for certain, um, the planning staff might be better positioned to answer this question. Uh, Liza Monroe, Planning Department. So parking and loading is a separate review factor from the circulation, so it's one of the 13. Okay. Thank you. So parking and loading in and of itself is a separate factor? That is correct. Of the um, special use permit? That is correct, um, and it would be identified within the staff report as well as the application provided by the applicant. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? Mr. McCoy, if you have a question, please come forward. My question is, uh, at the location where the student union is being built, Presently, we're removing parking spaces from there. Within a block adjacent to that, we're building a dormitory. And on Austin Avenue, they're building another dormitory. Does your study include the parking for those dorms and the residents in those dorms? Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Any further questions for Ms. Brown? Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Mr. Bryan, if you have, I believe you have a third. <clears throat> yes, uh, Mr. Like Mayor, we'd like to call Mr. Jarvis Martin, and we would like to have him introduced and examine, or his testimony be treated as <coughs> expert testimony on real estate appraising and a real estate value. Thank you very much, and we will uh, accept Mr. Martin as an expert witness. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Jarvis Martin. I'm a state certified general appraiser. I'm certified by the Appraisal Institute with the SRA designation. And I'm proud to say that I've been in business here in Durham for over the past 35 years and have had the opportunity on numerous occasions to appear before the Planning Commission, the Board of Review, as well as uh, on occasion the Council. Uh, I, my resume is uh, on file with you for further review, and I'd be glad to go into it with detail if a uh, question. I was employed by the applicant to take a look at the uh, proposed new student center, to look at properties in close proximity to the proposed new student center, as well as uh, the impact that the current student center may have had on surrounding and adjacent properties. In this process, I conducted two market studies. The first market study dealt with properties that was within a point two. 2.5 mile radius, one fourth mile radius of the existing uh, student center over the past two years to see what sales activity that took place over that period of time. And then for the second study, I moved further out a, a half mile away or so from the campus and took another study over the same two year period to look at what property sales occurred and what impact that may have uh, generated. In the study that you have, uh, the data shows that the properties that were within 0.2 miles of the existing student union uh, sold uh, generally um, quicker than the properties that were further away, similar properties. Uh, they sold for slightly less per square foot, uh, but they sold all relatively uh, within the same a comparable time per period with the same what we call list to sales price ratio. That is what the property listed for and ultimately what it sold for. The properties that was a little further out uh, sold somewhat took a, had, a, had a longer sales period uh, than the properties that was closer to the campus, although they did sell for a few dollars more per square foot. So as a uh, trained real estate uh, professional, what does this tell me? Uh, and to the general public is that those properties that are closest to the existing campus and closest to the existing student union is not showing any adverse impact from that location as compared to properties that are a little further away that are of the similar size and the similar price range uh, in age. With that being the case, it is my professional opinion that the proposed new student union 
student union would be in harmony with the existing neighborhood, as is the current student union, and that based upon the proposed design of that student union, it's been designed in a manner to try to lessen any impact that the facility may have, which has been shown by data that the current center has minimal to no impact upon surrounding properties, their desirability, as well as their overall value. Also, testimony has been given by Mr. Smith and Ms. Brown, again, that the university and the planners have taken all necessary steps to try to minimize, again, the, the new student center from uh, having any adverse impact on those properties close proximity as well as in the general area. So with that in mind, it is my professional opinion that I recommend that the special use permit be granted for this case. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, first, I'll ask members of the council, are there any questions for Mr. Martin? Anyone have questions? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Just um, in your professional opinion, do you think that the speed of those sales could have an adverse impact on the market surrounding that one, that point two mile. You mean the shortness of the days on market? Yes. Well, as you well know, Durham is a desirable place, and this area of, of town has now become a very desirable area. And there are people who like to be within walking and biking distance of the university. So again, I, this, it speaks to Durham and it speaks to the desirability and the affordability <coughs> of homes in this area. And then I just wanted to, I'm sorry for my. Oh, go ahead. So, and then in addition to that, do you factor in any of the, I kind of like the greening or the tree, tree coverage that's in that area that exists now as opposed to the size of this large building <coughs> that's what, 105,000 square feet? Well, right now the, area behind Cecil Street where the building's going to go is an asphalt parking lot. So it, it doesn't have any, a whole lot of greenery, but I think the plan actually increases the greenery and buffer I was between just, the building and the residents on Cecil Street, which would be a desirable factor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Any other questions for Mr. Martin? Uh, Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Caballero, did you also have a question? Okay, Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Martin. Good to see you. Um, with, with respect to the properties that sell quicker, uh, closer to the university, how, how, in your experience, how frequent is it that it's actually the university buying them? Well, these, these are market sales. These were not sales to the university. These were people who bought, citizens who bought these properties. Is it common, though, for the institution, though, to, to enter the market and purchase properties close? You mean North Carolina Central? Yeah. Well, I do know for a fact that it did uh, purchase some of, some homes on Cecil Street, and I think the properties in question tonight was purchased uh, to accommodate the additional uh, land they needed. Okay. But th those sales are not in my study because they're not market sales. Got you. I was just, just you made a, the allusion you made to, uh, and I assume you're talking in general about properties that are in close proximity to, y your comps were based upon other houses near universities in, in general? Well, I, I have two studies. One where I took homes within a 0.25 mile radius of the existing student union. Mm -hmm. And over the past two years, there were 18 sales in that area. And, and in your study, did you find there was a, any degree of frequency that it was the actual university buying the properties? Uh, again, they were market sales to they were advertised in the local multiple listing service, mm -hmm. and they sold to the general public. Now, whether they were university staff or, or personnel who purchased those homes, I have no knowledge of that. Okay. Would you know if it was the, but the university would be allowed to buy it in, as an entity itself, wouldn't it? Yes, none of the sales that I looked at were sold to North Carolina Central University. I'm talking about in your study, though, in your, was there a trend, since you're alluding to comps that um, go above and beyond North Carolina Central, was there any trend line that showed that sometimes it was the university buying the properties? Uh, again, none of the sales in the 18 sales that I quote within that 0.25 mile radius 
was the buyer, North Carolina Central University, as the entity. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other Council Members have a question for Mr. Martin? Are there any opponents who have a question for Mr. Martin? I'll start with Mr. Kelly, and then I'll go to Ms. Riley. Thank you, uh, Richard Kelly. Um, so I, I understand you did two studies within 0.2 miles and slightly further out, but what's this, what are the sales on average for Durham as a whole, as far as in relation to this, higher, lower, in your expert opinion? Are you asking value or are you asking number? Sp speed it. I'm going to sustain that. I don't really see the relevance of that, Mr. Kelly. Uh, we're talking about the major special use permit for the student center. Well, because if the values are maintained at point, you know, within 0.2 miles or maintained at a certain value and selling at a certain speed, then relevance to the rest of Durham um, is important because you, I mean, you're taking a very small subsection of the city, right? And, and you're looking at values within that small amount of the small area of the city in comparison to similar neighborhoods across the city. But I don't, as I read the standard that our planning that our planning staff has for us, has provided for us in their memo, I don't see that that is relevant to the standard that has to be met by the applicant. Okay. I understand your general point, but I don't think it's really, uh, uh, I don't think it's really relevant to, I, I believe Mr. Bryan is right. Um, of the 18 uh, properties that you studied, um, were any of the residents aware of the expansion plans of the university for the student center? Uh, again, what motivated the people to sell, uh, they were listed by local realtors, uh, they were advertised uh, from that standpoint there, and they sold for in a reasonable time, which tells me that we had a willing buyer and a willing uh, seller in the marketplace who was satisfied with that transaction. Uh, whether the seller knew about the university's plans, I have no way of knowing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Ms. Riley and then Mr. McCoy will give you uh, a chance next. <clears throat> Good evening, Jillian Riley, live on Cecil Street. Sir, I was wondering if your report took into account rental prices. Took into what price? Rental prices, rental properties. No, ma'am, I was looking strictly at, at the sales activity. So you don't know if the proposed project would increase rental prices in the neighborhood? You increase rental prices? You don't know? No, I do not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riley. Mr. McCoy? Uh, Ronald McCoy again. In your report that you analyzed in your study, did you put the houses that North Carolina Central has purchased to see how the value of those houses compared against the other value? What Central was paying for those houses compared to the houses in the community? Uh, no, because there were, there were uh, generally uh, sales to the university. I did not include those in my study. I, I included data that the general public would be given an indication as to how they react to the buying and selling, not what the university were paying. Well, the residents here are concerned about our value, not what they are uh, down the road or further out. We like to know what the impact of taxes, tax assessments, Mr. the value of our home will be. Mr. McCoy, do you have a question? Yes, sir. Okay, can you ask your question? Does your study uh, incorporate the, the tax value and the sale, the, the tax value and appraisal value of the houses all over the community? Objection. Ask, asked and answered and also not material. And for clarity in the record, Madam Clerk, um, the statement about what the residents of the area are concerned about should be stricken from the record. Uh, don't see how that question is not material there, Mr. Bryan. Uh, I'm going to allow that question. Mr. McCoy, can you please state your question again? It was, uh, my he, he said he didn't. Uh, my question was, 
Does his study that he did in the neighborhood, does that incorporate the impact? Does it also, you didn't look at the, the prices that North Carolina Central paid for the houses in the community. Mr. What'd you say, Mr. Brown? Yeah. Mr. McCoy, can you ask a question? Ask a question. You can, you can put that in the form of a question, a new question. Yes, sir. Your study of home sales in the area, you're stating that you did not include in your study. What's your question, Mr. McCoy? This is a question. Okay, go ahead and ask it. Did he include in his study the impact of the houses okay. that Central purchased? All right. Mr. 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 I, I did not. Those were not considered market sales. They were not advertised to the general public, so they were not included in my study. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Mr. Mr. Bryan, I just want to be clear about one thing. These people that are here today, you are a lawyer. They are not. I'm going to be cutting them a little slack. I'm going to be... I'm going to be, uh, if, if someone doesn't quite have their question together, I just want to be absolutely clear that I'm going to be permitting them to figure out a way to ask that question, and I'm going to be help them do it. I'm not going to allow anything in the, in the record that I believe is, is um, in any way uh, 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 not relevant or not applicable to the, uh, to the question at hand, but I'm also going to, you're an expert. You're here as a lawyer, and you're real good at your questions. Not everybody is, and I'm going to make sure that they have the opportunity to ask their questions. I just want to be real clear about that. Mr. Mayor, I don't object to that at all. I, I have an obligation on behalf of part of the client and to object to uh, evidence which is objectionable and to object to questions which are objectionable. The question in, that you're responding to uh, is was asked and answered several times before Mr. I, I can't remember Mr. Kelly or which, whichever uh, person it was that answer, asked the question, and that that was the basis of my objection. The question as to whether it was or was not included was was the 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 had been answered already. So that, that's why I was objecting. No offense to anybody here. I, I have no choice. I must object when I when it's when I when there's an objectionable question asked. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any questions? Any other questions for Mr. Mark? Mr. Mayor, so I just want to be clear so the, your study included just solely included market sales properties that were listed it, it did not include any situations where an institution exercised right of first refusal or just approached a landowner and uh, negotiated a transaction in that way is that correct I, I did not include any of the sales of the homes that North Carolina Central purchased along that section of Cecil Street. The study that I did included sales that were generated from a two-year search of the Triangle Multiple Listing Service. They may have been other sales between private individuals within this two-mile radius that may not be included in mine, but my study was comprehensive enough to give a good indication as to what market activity was for this area. Well, let me ask it this way, just so I understand. Did your study include any other institutions other than North Carolina Central? No, because this, they had an existing student union, which would show what market activity was, and they are simply replacing that with a newer facility. So it, what was your baseline? I'm a layperson. So what were you comparing your, your baseline to? Well, the, the, within the study, you will see uh, two charts that shows the list price sale of the homes, the days on the market, mm -hmm. and the, the ratio that, that occurred. And then I gave you examples of the homes which are on Cecil Street that I took pictures of, and then there was two homes which is further away and not on Cecil Street to show the comparability in terms of the size the age and the general price range. Got you. So again, I'm, I'm gauging the reaction of the buyers and sellers in these two areas over a two year period. Got you. Thank you, Ms. Martin, appreciate it, it's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Councilmember Middleton. Any other questions for Mr. Martin? Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Much appreciated. Mr. Uh, Bryan? 
Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, sir. that concludes our evidence uh, at this time. I'd like to move into evidence all the exhibits relied upon or referred to by the witnesses, including the staff report and all of its attachments and the various reports created by our expert witnesses. I think they've already been accepted into evidence. Is that correct? They have. Thank you. Um, the applicant's burden is to submit competent material, substantial evidence into the record showing that it meets all the requirements of the UDO for the approval of the requested major special use permit and site plan. In this case, we've met this standard, and therefore we respectfully request your approval of the major site plan and also the special use permit. Mr. Smith did a very good job of drawing your attention to the evidence in the record which shows that the site has been designed in conformance with all the applicable UDO standards. This firm has worked with your staff on the site plan before you to ensure exactly that. Ms. Brown presented evidence to you related to traffic and parking. Not only did a report evaluate traffic and parking for the proposed use, but it also evaluated the effect parking and traffic demands for the entire campus through the fall of 2023, taking into account various plan construction development projects. She found that the plan for the student center provides adequate parking for the use and that its design is calculated to reduce the number of trips to the southwest quadrant of the campus, which should have a, a corresponding decrease in the amount of traffic going into the southwest quadrant of campus. Finally, Mr. Martin analyzed the effect that the use will have on property values in the area, and he concluded that property values will not be adversely impacted by the proposed student center. It's important to keep in mind that the standard um, that must be met with regard to property values is whether the property values are going to be lowered by the student center, and not whether they're going to be increased. And there are people who will argue that increasing the property values is a bad thing. That is a concept which is foreign to the zoning ordinance, to the UDO. Uh, it may be a, a topic for discussion that you all ought to have, and it may be a topic for discussion about future changes to the UDO, but that is not the standard that is in the UDO. Um, the site plan has been reviewed and approved by all the relevant departments subject to your approval, and the only remaining approval is yours. <clears throat> so all the competent substantial material evidence in the record shows the applicant has met all the requirements of the UDO for approval of requested major special use permit and site plan, and the evidence also shows that the new student center will improve traffic and property values in the area. Therefore, we hope not only that you will recognize that NCCU has met all the legal requirements, but also that the new student center will be an asset to the Durham community. We respectfully request your approval of both the permit and the site plan, and we'll be glad to address any further questions that you may have as the evening progresses. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Brian. very much. Uh, thank you very much. We'll now hear from any opponents to the application. Uh, are there any opponents to the application who would like to, sue, to uh, speak at this time? Mr. Kelly, could please come to the microphone? Richard Kelly. Um, <clears throat> we have not had adequate time to prepare for this at all. Um, we were first notified the week of July 9th through a letter about, a, again, a listening session for a rezoning meeting. Um, the listening session was supposed to incorporate feedback from the residents into any communication that was going forward and any planning that was going forward. And that obviously has not been done as somebody who was at that meeting. Um, the meeting was held on July 16th. The letter that we received was the first time that we were clear that a student center was being built. We had no knowledge beforehand that this was going to happen. We were told this was a phase during this meeting in a larger construction plan. And I understand that this hearing is specifically for the, the, for the student center and for the special permit. But this expansion plan includes all of the people that were sent letters and affected by the, the traffic and parking of the student center. The plan is the campus master plan update that was Mr. Mayor, I have to distributed that was distributed at that meeting. Excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Prime. Larger plan the Thank you. Mr. Mr. Yes. Kelly, if your point is relevant to the student center, if you could tell us how, that would be great. 
As it pertains to the traffic flow and parking um, in the surrounding communities, and again, if you state that you respect the surrounding community, then you really should engage them in a way that's meaningful. And there has been no transparency in this process. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to ask our staff uh, Mr. Young could you come forward please Or thank you Ms. Monroe Yes Happy may you please repeat the question I'll I'll repeat the question uh, Mr. K have you heard Mr. Kelly's testimony Yes I was listening to Mr. And Mr. Kelly is, has said that uh, they were not adequately notified about the uh, major special use permit uh, and, and can you speak to that, please? The notice was sent out at the time that was required um, by state statutes for the major special use permit. Um, I was going to come up a little bit later and say the listening session was not something that was like put on by staff, nor was staff in attendance. Um, there is not a required neighborhood meeting for a major special use permit. It's a requirement of the rezoning. So um, we might be crossing hairs a little bit there. Understood. But the notices well, were done for this project, including a mailed notice. There's an email also sent out, and there was a sign located on the property. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Same objection, Mr. Mayor. Pardon me? I'm renewing my objection, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll, I'll sustain your objection. Mr. Uh, Kelly, uh, I think that you heard staff, and Mr. Ryan is saying that uh, your questions about um, transparency and so forth are not rel relevant to the standard. Uh, I'm going to agree with that, but I'm also going to notice that the staff has said that the requirements were met. Thank you. May I ask uh, of the staff what the mail requirement is for? Ms. Monroe, could you, um, could you talk about the uh, major special use permits, the notification requirements? Uh, Eliza Monroe, Planning Department. So it is required that notification letters be sent to property owners within 600 feet of the subject site two weeks prior to the hearing date. Um, also, there's going to be a sign that's posted on the property, as mentioned before, and there's also a legal ad posted in two, two of the Herald signs. So those are all of the notification measures that are required, and they were all met for this site. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Thank you. So again, not living within that 600 feet, just outside of it. Um, again, people who are adversely affected by this were not notified, right? And again, I understand the requirement is not that we be notified, but I would like the council to consider that the impact of that student center, I mean, it does extend Objection, beyond. Mr. Mayor. Not material. I I feel like that's material. Go ahead, Mr. Kelly. Um, I think that uh, I have spent the last two weeks canvassing the neighborhood and informing the residents um, on the opposite side of, on the west side of <coughs> Cecil Street, on the west side of Fayetteville. Um, all of the rest of the residents on Cecil, all of the residents on Martha, and um, on Burlington Avenue. And I spoke with several residents who are completely unaware of this objection situation. hearsay. Mr. Mr. Kelly, I'm going to sustain his objection. Yes. But in addition, you have made this point, we have spoken to it, staff has talked about the fact that the requirement has been met. I understand that you might not like the requirement, but that's something that our, our staff and council could take up and have taken up many, many times about yes. whether or not we have adequate distance, those are, those are things that we try to be very thoughtful about and have tried to be thoughtful about. But in this case, it is clear that the requirements are met. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Any other, uh, Mr. McCoy? Uh, I'll have to say that this is a new process to everyone and uh, I'm still trying to figure out if it's a democratic process. So, Mr. McCoy, yes, sir. unlike most of the processes we go through, which are legislative in nature, 
That yes, is, we can, we, we can make decisions based on any, uh, anything that we want and our, our opinions, correct. the facts that we hear. That's correct. This is not a legislative uh, process, and so it is not, uh, and, and so it is not democratic in the sense that we might think about it, that we can just decide on anything. This is a decision that was within a democratic process, but it's quasi-judicial. So we, we go by these judicial guidelines and standards that have to be met that are set out for us in our ordinances. Uh, and so I understand that it might not look like most of the things that we take up, but I think that's just, I know that's the situation we're in tonight. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, one of the one of the things I, I I keep hearing that we're saying that we have addressed the traffic issue in the neighborhood. One of the things I think I heard of the young lady say that they're going to adjust the traffic light that will allow traffic to flow out of Central, I mean out of Cecil Street, onto Austin Avenue. Uh, I don't believe adjusting the traffic flow is, is going to uh, alleviate uh, any of our problems. Uh, basically, right now, I live on Cecil Street. When school is not in, I can get in and out of my driveway, just back out. When school is in, it takes me a minimum of five minutes to get out of my driveway. So to me, there's a traffic issue. I don't think anybody in this room take five minutes to back out of their driveway and say there's no traffic issue. So to me, based upon what they say, I see a traffic issue, but based upon their report, they don't see a traffic issue. Uh, one of the other things I have communicated, I've tried to communicate with Central on special events. On special events as far as homecoming, the traffic flow in the community is, is, is overloaded. Objection, Mr. Mayor. This is not related to the Student Center. I, I, so I do believe that your comments regarding Cecil Street is relevant, yes, sir, that's but, not, but not the general traffic well, in the area. On Cecil Street, the traffic flow normally during school is excessive, and during special events, football games, homecoming, and those, those events, it's even more than that. Same objection, um, Your Honor. It doesn't re relate to the student center. It relates to special events. That they Agreed. On I, I understand, Mr. Bryant. I agree with you, and I sustain that objection. Well, I'm talking about traffic flow at this particular time. Okay. Yeah, right. Please make it relevant to the student center. And my, uh, my question is, if we have a problem now with traffic flow, and we are increasing the capacity, bringing more people in. We're building two new dorms. We're building the student unit center. That I don't think there has been a study done that's going to handle that kind of traffic. I would like to know from the planners the number of cars that are going to be increased by the two dorms Mr. in the parking facility that's going to be for those, those Boy, particular so places. These, those two dorms aren't part of what we're here today to talk about. We're talking about the traffic generated by the student center. That's correct. So to that, go back and forth to dorms, sir, there will be traffic. Okay. To get on and off of campus, they got to have a, a way of going there. Okay. I live on Cecil Street. The entrance to the the uh, utility entrance to the um, to the student union is going to be on Cecil Street. So now, in addition to the cars, I will have 18 wheelers and other commercial vehicles traveling by my house to turn to go into that particular center. That, to me, appears to be a traffic problem. But that's certainly relevant. Thank you, Mr. Well, I would like to have that issue addressed, or my concerns addressed. All right, thank you. We'll, we'll make sure they're addressed. Um, any other opponents like to speak at this time? Ms. Riley. Good evening, y'all. I'm Jillian Riley. I live on Cecil Street. Um, and I've lived on Cecil Street for about six weeks now. So I was probably one of those houses that was in the study, uh, most likely. Um, and when I move into a, a new community, I like to ground myself and learn about what's going on, which is why I'm here tonight. Um, and although I'm speaking as an opponent to the, to the new proposed project, the truth is I'm excited about it. Right? I'm excited about Central. Um, one of the reasons why I live, moved and chose the house that I live in now is because 
um, Central's a great institution, a great university. Um, that being said, I, um, I know that they've met the requirements of transparency and the requirements um, to inform the community, um, but you know, I had, to, I had to search for it. So personally, um, I don't feel like that I was properly informed, and I would like, I would urge the council to have a condition that has a non-quasi judicial hearing, not here at that city hall, but actually in, in the community, um, not on Central's campus, uh, but to bring people together to talk about this and how it's gonna affect people. Um, so that's what I would say. Thank you, Ms. Raleigh. Uh, Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Yes, sir. Sir, could you give us your name, please, and your address? Uh, Charles Kelly, 623 Burlington, Durham. Um, my expertise is just I'm a resident of the area. Um, I'd just like to ask a question. When these studies were done, did anyone, like, go talk to the residents as part of the study for, like, the, for the real estate, for, for the house values, for the parking studies? Did anyone canvas the neighborhood to talk to any of the residents as part of the whole study process? I'm sorry, are you asking me? Anyone. <laughs> Mr. Kelly, you, you need to identify a witness to whom you're directing Oh, I'm question. sorry. Um, well, uh, to, the, to the parking, um, I, I, I don't know. Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown. Brown. I'm sorry. Is it, is it acceptable for, the, for Ms. Brown to come back at this time and answer the question this way? You know that the applicant had closed. Oh, I'm sorry. Case. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Oh, well, um, I thought everything had to be in the form of a question. So we'll be glad. I'll be glad to have her come up and answer. But I. Don't. Well, why don't you do that then, Mr. Okay. Brown? Can you answer? Your case. Question. The, did, did you say your question again, Mr. Kelly? So during your study, uh, did anyone canvass the neighborhood to talk to any of the residents when, as these studies were being put together? Did, what, was any input included from any of the residents? Um, the study was done according to ITE manual and as far as the city of Durham's requirements, and that was not one of the requirements. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, is there anyone who has any questions for these uh, witnesses who spoke in opposition to the, to the, uh, to this permit? Anybody have any questions for them? Can we get Mr. Riley's, Ms. Ms. Riley's address? Sure, Ms. Riley, thank you. 414 Cecil Street. Okay. I, it's, it's difficult. I would like to ask some questions about, about, some, of the, about some of the testimony. Is, is there one of you who would like to talk about parking? Would, would any of you all like to answer a question Which about Which one of you would like Mr. to talk Mr. about Brian? parking in particular? Would you like to answer questions for Mr. Brian as, about this? Mr. Kelly, go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> and, and I'm getting, could you state your name again for the record, yes, sir? Yes, Richard Kelly, 623 Burlington. Kelly, my, my understanding of your testimony and that of the other folks who testified here this evening is that the parking of cars on the campus itself has never caused difficulty, but rather it's the parking of cars on the public streets around the campus that has caused difficulty. Is that correct? I could not answer that question. I don't have that knowledge. Uh, you don't know? I don't know if parking on campus is an issue. I know that parking off campus is an issue. All right. So you, to your knowledge, is parking on campus an issue, yes or no? I don't have the you don't know. data to support a conclusion one way or the other. All right, so the parking problem that you're concerned about is people who park off campus, is that correct? Yes, the students who are not uh, eligible or able to pay for uh, on-campus. Now, you, you students, don't know that they're not students eligible. Students and staff that are not. Do you, do, well, on what basis do you draw, you have no basis to draw the conclusion that What's they're, your question, they're Mr. either, I'm, I'm there, I'm getting there. You have no basis, do you, sir, to conclude that all these people are not eligible or not able to pay for parking on campus, do you? 
or they just don't par pay for parking, yes. All right, so it's, it's really just people who are parking on the streets. You don't really know why they're parking on the streets. That's correct, is that? Correct, I just okay. know that um, they park on up and down all of the streets in our right. neighborhoods. And, and Central doesn't have any power to control who parks on private residential streets, does it? Other than providing parking for students who either might not be able to afford it or who uh, staff who might not be able to afford it or staff students who may not want to pay for it. Well, the testimony was is that parking is, the free parking is available on campus, was it not? Not free during peak hours, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if the people who are parking on the private streets are doing so illegally or improperly, Central can't do anything about that either, can it? No, that's up to the city. Um, in fact, unless there's an ordinance that says they can't park there, anybody can park there. Is that correct? It's a controlled parking, yes. I'm Resident sorry? It's, it's controlled parking, residential permit A. All right, so these are people who don't have permits who are parking in that area. There's a two-hour window where you're allowed to park on, this, on the streets um, and if you're not a resident of the area. Okay. But during that two-hour window, anybody can park there, is that correct? Correct. That's your understanding? It is. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryan. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Any other questions for any of the witnesses? All right, thank you. Thank you so much. In closing, Mr. Mayor, I would like to say that one of the rec recommendations that was made, um, I, I understand these people and their concerns, but it's it's not, it doesn't relate specifically to the Student Center, it doesn't relate specifically to the Major Special Use Permit. However, we've gone a little bit far afield from that. One of the recommendations that was made in the traffic study was that Central look into entering into a uh, an agreement with the city in the same way that Duke University has entered into an agreement which would restrict parking in on private streets in the area around the campus um, to only put people who have permits and that's something that can be done in the future seems like to, a future policy issue Mr. right that is correct thank you uh, I'm now going to ask um, I'm pardon me I'm sorry mr. Kelly I can't hear you uh, yes you may please respond to that and I believe that'll be the last response we have tonight and then we'll go to staff um, I don't think our concern is that uh, the students are parking on our streets. Um, we have had a good relationship with the students to the point where when they've blocked our driveway, we haven't had their cars towed. I think that the issue is the change in parking that's going to occur during either peak times or off peak times when you reduce the number of parking spaces that are available adjacent to the student center and when they have special events that could be upward of two to 3,000 people when they take advantage of the uh, grassy area outside. Um, again, we don't have an issue with the students parking there. We don't really have an issue with the university. Um, we just want to be adequately informed so that we can prepare for hearings like this. And I respectfully suggest that the motion to accept this permit and permits like this be tabled until the public has adequate opportunity to prepare for something like this. Because we are not lawyers, right? We can only speak to things that, that you know, within our sphere of, of experience, and this is just not one of those things. If we can adequately, adequately prepare for something like this, it takes time to get organized, it takes time to get prepared, and the university has had months, if not years, to prepare for this. We've had next to no time at all. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask now uh, for the, the staff and whether or not they have a re recommendation concerning the major special use permit. Eliza Monroe with the Planning Department. Um, just wanted to double back and clarify and kind of reiterate some of the information that was stated in terms of um, parking. Uh, per the UDO section 10.3.1, um, as well as a review by the City of Durham Transportation Department and other departments for the site plan, 
on site on campus parking is being required and adequately and meets our UDO standard. Um, so I do want to clarify that and it kind of piggybacks onto what Mr. Kelly just stated um, during the cross examining from Mr. Bryan. Um, so I do want to just state that the city does review whether the parking is provided, not necessarily the price of it. Um, that's not something that's within our jurisdiction to have any type of say over. That is the responsibility and the um, privilege of the university. Uh, so I do want to just kind of clarify that there. Um, in terms of recommendations, staff does recommend approval of the major special use permit M190001, provided that the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and information submitted to the council as part of the application. Thank you very much, Ms. Monroe. You've heard the recommendation of staff. Is there any discussion or is there a motion uh, by a member of the council? Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to ask if staff thought it was appropriate to include the condition to make sure that the um, there was a coordination of signalization as was advised and recommended. Staff does believe that condition is something that can be included. And I would move that motion that it, I'll read the whole thing. We have, we have a motion that, that we grant the permit with the conditions recommended by staff. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we grant a permit with the conditions recommended by staff. Before we vote, I'll ask, is there any discussion by members of the council? Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to be supporting uh, the grant of this uh, permit. I think the uh, university has met the findings and review factors. And I do want to say to members of the uh, um, public and community that came out tonight, we thank you for your time, for being here. And, and we've heard everything that you said. Um, and take it very seriously. And I know the hour is upon us, so thank you so much. I do want to say, um, as I support this, that um, North Carolina Central University is, is one of the leading HBCUs in our nation. And I think that this student center, uh, new student center, will be reflective uh, of the stature of the university. So I'm excited uh, to see it uh, going forward. I think it also will accrue benefit not only to the students and members, the immediate members of the North Carolina Central University Committee, uh, community, uh, but to all of us who live in Durham. That's why I look forward to going as many concerts and shows and presentations there as I do uh, on Duke's campus. So I will be supporting the... Uh, thank you. Thank you. Council Member. Anyone else have comments? Mr. Mayor, I'd also like to add an addition to um, agreeing with uh, Council Member Middleton's comments that it's, it's great to acknowledge um, the historical significance of the university, but I also want to highlight that it's important to make sure that they significance of the university recognizes that transparency and support of your neighbors is important in our, in our context of conversation. Because we, as we move forward, we've been having these conversations around equity and making sure that we're equitably engaging. It'd be important to make sure that as a leader in this community, that the university is also doing the same thing. So I just want to impress upon that and say thank you for the work that you do in the university and continue to push, press forward. I, I would also be supporting. Any other comments? Uh, I, uh, I want to say before we vote to those, uh, Mr. McCoy, Ms. Kelly, Mr. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly, and Ms. Riley, thank you for being out here. Um, I um, appreciate the concerns that you raised. I do think many of them are policy concerns that are larger policy concerns. I do appreciate also the, um, uh, I, I want to suggest, Ms. Riley, uh, that you be in contact with people within the university, with their uh, public relations staff, or perhaps someone here tonight, Ms. Matheson, uh, and, and your request for a meeting to talk about future impacts. I'm sure the university would be more than willing to meet with the folks on Cecil Street. Um, I see Mr. Page here, I know Dr. Uh, Reverend Page, who is, I know that's part of his responsibility, and I know he's something he does very well. So I'm sure that he would be happy to talk to you after this meeting uh, and arrange for a meeting with the neighbors. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kelly, uh, thank you for uh, raising the issue uh, of the notice. Uh, this, this uh, as I said, we examine, we think a lot about what our notif notices are, our notification periods. Uh, we don't have these major special use permits very often. In fact, I, in my eight years up here, I think maybe this is my third or fourth. And so uh, I know I haven't thought about the notification period in a while, and uh, I'll just ask our staff to give that some thought and appreciate your recommendation in that regard. Um, I, it is absolutely clear that the university has met all of the, uh, 
all the standards uh, that are required. I think that uh, I don't really think there's a close call on any of them. I appreciate the expert and fact witnesses that are uh, came forward today and appreciate your presentation as well, Mr. Bryan. And you are argumentative, sir. <laughs> um, all right, uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Uh, if not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? It is open. Will you please close the vote? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. I believe we are now to move on to the um, site plan, a major site permit. Is that correct? Thank you. See a little nodding heads. Good. Thank you. Um, let's see here. So are we to hear from staff on that, Mr. Young? Staff doesn't um, usually provide, Eliza Monroe Planning Department, excuse me, um, the site plan is consistent, what was, is consistent with what was submitted with the application and um, the evidence provided by the applicant today. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I believe that the uh, uh, action required would be us, for us to simply approve the site plan, is that correct, Madam Attorney? I'd like to move, move approval to approve. for the site. It's been moved and seconded Second. that we approve the site plan. I do want to, before we do so, uh, I do just want to mention uh, in the permit, in the document on page five, there's a chart. Uh, I believe the tree coverage and open space blocks on that chart are mixed up and the tree coverage information is in the open space information and the uh, Open space information is in the tree coverage information, is that correct? Page five, there's a chart. Mr. Mayor, you're referring to page five of the staff report? I am, uh, page five of the site plan, no, not the site plan reduction. Um, application. Where's the information about the site plan, Pat? That would have been page five. I read this a couple days ago. Major special use permit, uh, page five. I think. Sure. Let me grab. Let me grab that. Yeah. Yep. Attachment four. It's attachment four, Mr. Mayor. I believe. Say again, Charlie. I believe that's attachment four, Mr. Mayor. Page Under five. section H. Five of nine. Yep. For environmental protection. Um, or the screening, buffering, and landscaping. There is a chart. Sorry about no, the No, it's delay. not the one on page five. I'm sorry. There's a chart on page three of the um, site plan uh, report, which is attachment four of the agenda item. Is that what you're referring to? Say it again. Sure. So attachment four of the agenda item is the site plan report. And there's a there's a table on page two and page three. Mm -hmm. I guess I need you to direct me to the attachment four. I, my attachment four is major special use permit. What's is, what's the name of it? That'd be number six. So a, attachment four to to the uh, agenda tonight's agenda item is the major site plan report. Are you referring to the site plan report or the special use permit? Site report? plan report. Okay. Um, so on page two, the dimensional requirements are noted, and on page three are the general ordinance requirements. And I'm, I try to scan those quickly. I'm not seeing okay. any errors jump out at me, but I really I, appreciate I, I you. I am sorry identifying. that I can't identify it. I'll work on that. Um, yeah, no, it's, I'll work on it and, and uh, get back to you. I don't know, it, you know, it's certainly not relevant to this tonight, but I don't know if this document is necessary for anything else. And if so, I will. It might be page eight. I will, uh, I'll get you the information. 
Okay, well, um, the, your, your action tonight would approve the site plan. Understood. If we if we find errors, we'll we'll bring it back as a supplemental item to yeah. amend. I, I don't think it's an, I, it's it's uh, it's just in the information you gave us, and I'm sorry I can't identify it. I usually sure. do better. All right, thank you. We have a motion to approve the uh, site plan and uh, yeah. a second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you. All right. I believe we've done everything we need to do on item 32. And we'll now move to item. Thank you all for being here, folks from Central. We appreciate you all being here. Uh, we'll now move to item 33, consolidated item 1435 Camden Avenue. You will be pleased to know that this is a major special use permit hearing. Um, the next matter is agenda item 33, which includes a major special use permit application for 1435 Camden Avenue, application number M190002. The hearing in this matter is judicial in nature and will be conducted in accordance with special safeguards. Witnesses must be sworn in. They are subject to cross-examination and written evidence must be offered for incorporation into the record. I'll ask now for people who wish to testify uh, to please come uh, forward to the clerk uh, they should have signed in previously on the special sheet for this hearing at the clerk station. If you've not already done so, please go to the clerk station now and sign in. Anyone who plans to testify, including city staff, should now go to the clerk station to be sworn in or give your affirmation and then please return to your seat. Anyone who is planning to testify on item 33, if you would please go to the clerk station to be sworn in. All right, um, please raise your right hand and put your left in the vicinity of the Bible. Um, please affirm or swear, so help you God, by saying I do after I give the oath. Do you solemnly swear, so help you God, or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, to the best of your ability? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Clerk, this uh, sheet has very few of the people who uh, need to sign up to have signed up. So there should be two sheets. There might, there are not two seat sheets for item 33 that I have. Oh, item 33. Okay, we've got clips. Ms. Clips? Oh no, these are both producing. It was just this one. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, give that to you. Uh, I'm going to ask people who have not signed. We only have three people who are signed up to testify who have signed the sheet. So I'm going to ask you all please now to go to the clerk's office, go to the clerk's desk and sign that sheet. If you are planning to testify and have not signed that sheet, go over there now please and sign the sheet. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, do any council members need to withdraw from consideration of this case because of a conflict that would prevent them from rendering a fair and impartial decision in this matter? Any council members? Thank you. <clears throat> have any council members heard information about this case other than what may have been presented at work session or in the staff report? If so, please disclose that information at this time. Any council members? All right, thank you very much. Uh, before we begin, I'd like a representative or an attorney for the applicant and for any opponents to come to the microphone and identify yourself to the council and then take a seat in the front row. Uh, is now the appropriate time? My name is Neil Gosh. I'm an attorney with the Morning Star Law Group at 112 West Main Street here in Durham. I'm representing the applicant on this. <clears throat> Bill Bryan, uh, Morning Star Law Group, representing the applicant. 
Thank you. Are there any other attorneys representing either the applicant or any other party? Thank you very much. Um, to the attorneys, if any attorney or representative wishes to cross-examine a witness, please raise your hand immediately after the witness is testified and I'll recognize you. All written information, including maps, you may want to consider should be officially submitted as evidence. Copies of evidence you want to have admitted, with the exception of the staff report and attachments, should be given to the city attorney and to the opposing side, if any. Each side may raise objections to the admission of evidence on the basis of relevance, hearsay, or any, any other evidentiary ground. Questions concerning admissibility will be handled by the city attorney. Please do not hand anything directly to council members until it's first been reviewed by the city attorney and has been admitted as evidence. We will first hear from city staff who have studied the request, then from the applicant, and then from the opponents to the application, if any. We'll now open the hearing and hear from city staff. Thank you, Mayor Shul. Uh, good evening. I'm Danny Coulter, representing the planning department. Um, at this time, uh, planning staff requests that all agenda materials submitted for the public hearing be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. Um, there is one typographical correction that we found in the staff report, and it's reference to a variance case number. Uh, I believe that reference uh, was a reference of B19-00018, and it should read as B18-0008. 0008, excuse me. Um, the request uh, for a major special use permit M19-00002 and a major site plan D18-00322 have been received from Bill Bryan with Morningstar Law Group representing WJD Holdings LLC and from Raleigh Concrete LLC respectively to construct a ready mix concrete manufacturing facility and utilize four existing single story buildings totaling 6,142 square feet on approximately 2.26 acres of a 10.058 acre site located at 1435 Camden Avenue and zone industrial, uh, which is I. Uh, major transportation corridor I-85, MTC I-85, and Falls Jordan District B Watershed Overlay, or FJB, and within the urban tier. Uh, concrete manufacturing plant requires the issuance of a major special use permit, uh, MSUP, pursuant to the Unified Development Ordinance Section 5.1.2 use table, <coughs> is also subject to the limited use standards of UDO Section 5.3.6b. Um, when a site plan associated with a major use permit, the site plan also has to be considered a major site plan which requires governing body approval. The council approves the major special use permit and the council should also consider the approval of the associated major site plan. The site plan item does not require a public hearing but does require the separate vote for approval. If the council elects to deny the major use permit, then the site plan should not be approved as the site plan would not be in compliance with the applicable UDO standards. Um, the public hearing uh, item for you is the major special use permit uh, item M19-00002. Uh, the applicant is proposing to construct a ready mix concrete manufacturing facility which requires the issuance of the major special use permit. Uh, additionally, there are limited use standards required for a concrete manufacturing facility listed in UDO section 5.3.6b. Um, per UDO section 5.3.6b1, a concrete manufacturing facility shall not be located within 1,500 feet of a property is on residential. However, intervening streets, uh, highway streets, railroads, and similar rights of ways shall be included in the 1,500 foot measurement. Also per UDO section 5.3.6B3, the site shall be at least four acres in area and shall have direct access on a major or minor thoroughfare or boulevard. Um, the site meets the minimum acreage requirement but does not provide direct access off the required roadway type. Um, in August 2018, the Joint City County Board of Adjustments approved two variances uh, from the res residential separation requirement and the direct uh, access limited use standard requirements mentioned above. Uh, that was case B18-00008. The board granted these variances as strict application of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship for the applicant given that no direct access can be made to U.S. Interstate 85 and that Camden Avenue already has daily industrial traffic although only classified as a collector street. Uh, also that many of the surrounding residential uh, zone parcels can't be developed due to environmental constraints. Uh, a site plan is submitted in conjunction with this request, attachment 3B, case D18-00322, 
That site plan is currently under review and is clear of comments. For UDO section 3.9.8, uh, the four findings and 13 review factors must be addressed in order to grant the use permit. Those findings and review factors are identified in the staff report, attachment three, and in the application sub-attachment 3A. Uh, those four findings are for the proposed use are, uh, the general findings are in harmony, one, in harmony with the area not substantially injurious to the value of the properties in the general vicinity, two, in conformance with all special requirements applicable to the use, three, will not adversely affect the health or safety of the public, and four, will ad adequately address the review factors. The 13 review factors must address how the development manages A, circulation, B, parking and loading, C, service entrances in areas, D, lighting, E, signage, F, utilities, G, open spaces, H, environmental protection, I, screening, buffering, and landscaping, J, effect on adjacent property, including but not limited to noise, odor, lighting, and traffic, K, combat compatibility, L, consistency with policy, and M, other factors, which could be such as the limited use standards. Staff has analyzed the application and finds that most of the factors above meet ordinance compliance based on the submitted site plan. However, the applicant must show how the proposed development does not adversely affect adjacent property in regards to value, noise, odor, and traffic, and is compatible with property in the area. Staff does, not, does anticipate noise will be created by a concrete manufacturing facility. No noise analysis was provided from the applicant as to the effects of the city's, but the city's noise ordinance will have to be met for the proposed facility. In addition, most of the adjacent parcels are vacant or have industrial type uses. Regarding traffic, the proposed use did not necess necessitate the requirement for a traffic impact analysis due to the number of vehicular peak hour trips anticipated into or out of the site. However, a TIA for the site was conducted in January of 2018 by a consultant hired by the applicant and was provided as an exhibit during the approval of their previous requested variance. The traffic consistency with other nearby industrial uses in the TIA indicated that the proposed plant will not result in any adverse traffic patterns in the area. Odor is not anticipated to be generated from this type of use. The applicant must demonstrate, however, that the use is compatible with other development in the area. Staff recognizes that there is another concrete manufacturing facility on property adjacent to the application's property uh, just directly across from a railroad right of way. Um, in the general vicinity city of an industrial zoning in nature. The nearest residentially zoned property is approximately 410 linear feet from the proposed development, but is currently vacant. Per the argument pro provided by the applicant and accepted for the proposed variance, residentially zoned properties in the area cannot be developed due to current flood hazard impacts and will likely remain vacant. The applicant must provide evidence to demonstrate that the findings and review factors are being met. If the government governing body fails to find conformance with the condition and factors listed that the proposed, you, the proposed, proposed use permit must be denied. However, if the applicant provides evidence that demonstrates the findings and review factors are being met, the governing body must approve the use permit. Planning staff will make a re recommendation for the use permit prior to a vote on the public hearing. Staff is also available for any questions related to the use permit request. And if there are no questions, I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor Shul. Thank you, Mr. Coltra. Um, are there any questions for staff from members of the council? I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Reese. Thank you. Hi, how's it going? Sure. Awesome. Um, is there something unique about the way that this particular proper property is zoned? Um, or is it the case that any time a concrete manufacturing facility is proposed, a major special use permit must be issued. That is the case. Uh, and actually, concrete manufacturing facilities are only allowed in the industrial district. And, and they do require a major special use permit. So they both require one, exactly one specific zoning designation, and they must also get a, sp a major special, special use permit. permit. That is correct. That is my question. Thank you. You're very welcome. Other questions for the for staff at this point? Just one. I just wanted to know the time frame of the shift. I guess I'm, I'm assuming that the previous concrete and asphalt plant closed. When was it built? Um, I'm not quite aware of that. Of that. I could, we could let the applicant speak to the history of the original concrete manufacturing facility. 
And just well, specifically around um, how water mitigation was done when it was built and what they're looking to do, um, I guess, currently. If when we have the app, when we get the applicant, we'll yeah. have those questions. Any other questions for staff? Um, are, there are no stormwater measures required? Um, I'll look at the report again, but I don't think they had to do any mitigating st stormwater because all the site is uh, existing impervious surfaces yeah. on there. Um, how does a developer get to choose the high density option? Um, if they're in a watershed overlay, um, if you exceed 24% impervious surfaces, then you kick in the high density option uh, requirement. This particular site, uh, I, from my understanding, has been there for a long time with the existing impervious surfaces. The uh, applicant is actually reducing the existing impervious surfaces that are on, on site. I think they were about 74%. I believe they're reducing to, uh, to some, yeah, somewhere around 70%, yep. uh, if my what, recollection is what right. What is the high density? Could you explain to me what the high dens density option is? Um, it's where an applicant has to use some type of uh, best management practices or uh, uh, stormwater control measures in order to... Uh, to meet, uh, exceed those 24% impervious surfaces. And so in this case, the way that happened was that the, what the, is that they reduced the impervious surface percentage. Is that the, is that the best management practice that they pursued? Um, they actually, on this instance, the impervious surfaces were already existing, yeah. so they are actually decreasing it to bring yeah. it in better conformance with the ordinance. Is, is that related to the high density option? So, you know, uh, Pat Young with the planning department. I believe they're also, in addition to reducing the impervious surface, as Mr. Coulter described, I believe they're also implementing stormwater control measures, or often known as best management practices. I would recommend that you question okay, the applicant I, I, in, in more I'm detail that. about that provision, since we don't have our stormwater staff here tonight. Good. Thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. I, I, if so, yeah, stormwater I staff did evaluate the site, though. Mm -hmm. or in the site plan. Okay, yeah. Performance. Any other questions for staff? Are there any, uh, any other people here who would like to ask any questions to staff? All right, thank you very much, Mr. Culture. Appreciate it. And we'll now hear from the applicant. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tim Johnson, and members of the City Council. I know it's already been a long night, so I'll do my best. Uh, I am Neil Ghosh, an attorney at the Morningstar Law Group here in Durham at 112 West Main Street. I'm here tonight uh, on behalf of WJD Holdings, who is the owner of the property, uh, and also Mr. Juan Sanchez, or more correctly his company, Raleigh Concrete LLC, which uh, leases property from WJD Holdings. Uh, and we, were, we are here to present evidence in support of the application for a major special use permit to allow a concrete plant to operate on property located at 1435 Camden Avenue here in Durham. We also are requesting your approval of the major site plan associated with this use, which has been fully reviewed and vetted by your staff. Uh, with respect to the site plan, my understanding is that the only outstanding comment is that we need your approval. Uh, at this time, I would request that all materials referred to or used by the witnesses, including the staff report, all of its attachments, um, our application and site plan, be entered into the record and that judicial notice be taken with regard to the contents of the UDO, the comprehensive plan, and other adopted plans of the city and county of Durham. I have already handed up a packet of exhibits which we would like to enter into the record. Uh, and I will just give a brief rundown of what those exhibits entail. Uh, there are resumes for our expert witnesses and the reports that they have prepared. There's also two uh, exhibits. One is demonstrative of the uses along the Camden Corridor, and the last exhibit is uh, essentially a highlighted portion of the site plan to better illustrate the area which we're talking about today. Mr. Mr. Ghosh, uh, I'm going to turn to our city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have uh, reviewed the materials that Mr. Ghosh has submitted in support of their application, and Exhibit A, Exhibit B, and Exhibit C appear to be curriculum vitae that correspond to the experts that they will present to the council for their consideration. And they do appear to have the requisite experience and or education to testify with respect to land development engineering, transportation engineering, and real estate appraisal respectively. Right. Um, and as Mr. Ghosh indicated, 
There is also an Exhibit D that has a, a map of the area and a highlighted plat as Exhibit E. I recommend them to the council. Thank you. I'll accept them into the record. Thank you very much. And per the last hearing, I'm familiar with the council's uh, convention on tendering expert witnesses, so I'll do that as they uh, approach. I'm glad that that's now risen to the level of a convention. <laughs> <laughs> well, Congratulations, you know. Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this case is a bit of an oddity, and I wanted to take some time to explain the procedural posture, although staff has done a good job already. Uh, but I, we are on the second step of a two-step process for the applicant's intended use. Today, we are asking for your approval of a major special use permit to allow for a concrete plant on this site. The UDO imposes certain uh, limited use standards upon concrete plans or con concrete plants. Uh, our first step in the process was, however, to seek variances from the Board of Adjustment for a few of those supplemental standards. The first variance we sought was from the requirement that the facility be more than 1,500 feet away from any property zoned residential. The second variance we sought was from the requirement that the facility have direct access to a major or minor thoroughfare uh, or boulevard as defined by the city transportation plan. We received those variances from your Board of Adjustment. Uh, pursuant to the, to the order from the Board of Adjustment, those two supplemental standards no longer apply to this site with respect to a concrete plant use. Uh, therefore, we will not be presenting evidence tonight on those two supplemental standards. There are, of course, other requirements which we will, be, uh, which we will present competent material and substan substantial evidence to show that we meet. Um, uh, each of our expert witnesses will make reference to the specific section of the UDO for which their testimony is being offered. And at the close of our case, I will summarize the evidence we provided for each of the ap applicable standards. Before calling any of our expert witnesses, I would like to call first the property owner, Mr. Dan Wall, and uh, Mr. Tim Brown, who, uh, who I understand will be the plant manager at this location, to give you an introduction to the project and the property. So with that, I'll call Mr. Wall. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Good evening. My name is Dan Wall. My company is WJD Holdings, LLC. Um, I am the property owner, uh, is the property owner. Uh, we have owned the property since 2015 and did a lot of research prior to purchasing it. The property was a concrete plant in the past. However, we recognize that previous use of the property as a concrete plant was not grandfathered because of passage of time uh, since it was used for the purpose. Still, we felt um, that is a prime spot for the concrete plant for all the reasons you will hear tonight. When we bought the property, our intent was to reestablish its use as a concrete plant. The site already is set up nicely for this purpose um, from its historical use and the neighborhood is industrial in nature. Even some of the city's industrial services are located there. The, uh, the other thing to note is that my company owns one of the residentially zoned pieces north of I-85. The piece I own uh, backs up to LB Creek is in a regulatory floodway and is basically swampland. Uh, it also has no street frontage not only, um, not only will it, yeah, I never develop the site residentially, um, I probably will never be able to develop it for anything. Um, it just has too many environmental challenges. The reason I agreed to buy it is so that I can uh, ensure that I'll have a buffer. Um, as I said, our primary interest is in reestablishing a concrete plant on the property. Its historical use as a concrete plant and location in an industrial area makes this property a good location for a concrete plant. Thank you for hearing this matter. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Wall? Did I get your name right? Tell me your name. name. Wall. Mr. Wall, yeah. Is there, are there any questions for Mr. Wall? Thank you, Mr. Wall. Thank you, and I'll call up Mr. Tim Brown. Good evening, my name is Tim Brown. I'm with Raleigh Concrete LLC. We ought to put a concrete plant on the site, which is presently leased from WLD and Mr. Wall. 
We have looked at this site and evaluated it for our needs. Whenever we set up a plant, that's one of our primary concerns is, is that we be shielded from residential uses and have access to good roads and highway system. With this site, we found it to be shielded very well from residential uses. The closest residents are on the other side of I-85. The overpass here is a huge barrier because it's on, a, it's on an angle. You cannot see it to the other side from, the, from this property. Also, Camden Avenue, Camden, Camden Road provides quick access to I-85, which is just 0.8 miles away from the site. This access is excellent for a concrete plant. It is very short distance travel on a road already used for industrial purposes to a well-designed interchange straight onto a major highway. We are excited to be making this move, move to Durham. We already, already have 10 employees with the company that are from Durham, and they all keep asking when we're going to open the plant. They cannot wait to be transferred. Wow. It's really going to fire up a lot of, free up a lot of time for, the, for these guys when they come over so they won't have to travel as far to get home. And we have identified a few more Durham employees that will be coming on board once we open up the plant. We're just anxious to get started. So aside from that, we think the concrete plant will be a benefit to the area, not only because of the jobs it'll create, but also because it's a good use for this site. Right now it's messy and vacant, so we plan on cleaning it up and bring, putting the land back to work. Um, thank you for your considerations. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Uh, Councilmember Alston. Um, hi, Mr. Brown. Um, when does a concrete plant typically operate? Is it kind of a 24-hour operation? or No, it's uh, anywhere from like 5 in the morning to maybe like 6 at night. Now, the trucks might get hung out, but it doesn't run 24 hours. So you might have, it depends on if you're doing commercial work, you might have a late-night job, but not very, very often. Okay, great. Thank you. Right. Any other questions for Mr. Brown? Thank you very much. Mr. Gosh? Thank you. Our next witness will be Mr. Daniel Paps. He is our site planner. I am tendering him as an expert in his field. He did, his firm did develop the site plan that's before you. Thank you, Mr. Gush. We'll accept Mr. Paps as an expert witness. Good evening. My name is uh, Dan Paps, Paps Design Group. I'm a registered professional engineer with the state of North Carolina, owner and president of Paps Design Group and engineer of record for this property, for this project. Um, with that said, I'd like to address several major special use permit factors, the first, first of which is Harmony. Uh, the site is located along Camden Avenue, which is an industrial corridor in Durham. <coughs> there already are many industrial uses fronting Camden. As illustrated on Exhibit D, other uses along Camden Avenue north of ID5 include a truck repair shop, telecommunications equipment supplier, construction company, vending machine supplier, waste management service provider, fleet management department with fleet fueling station, fire department, and Sunrock, another concrete and asphalt production facility. Additionally, there previously was a concrete plant on the site, and later there was an asphalt plant. Our understanding is that the concrete plant on our property was one of the first uses established in this corridor in the 1930s. For clarification, I want to explain that the parcel on which we seek to establish a concrete plant functionally is split into three areas, each of which is fenced off from the others. We refer to them as the front, middle, and back sections. Our project is in the middle section, which you can see on Exhibit E. Given the existing industrial uses in the neighborhood, the existing concrete plant down the street, and the historical use of this property as a concrete plant, it is my professional opinion that consistent with UDO section 3.9.8A1, the establishment of a concrete plant on this property will be in harmony with the area. The second factor I'd like to address is health and safety. Uh, part of the reason this site was chosen for this use is that it's located along an existing industrial corridor. Industrial uses generally are not compatible with other types of uses given their intense nature. Additionally, many industrial uses require special equipment which can be difficult to maneuver and can create its own challenges. Given the existing industrial nature of the area, a concrete plant at this location 
will not introduce a significantly different or incompatible function to this area. Moreover, the site has been designed with safety in mind. While there is not a lot of non-industrial traffic through this area, we nevertheless want the site to be secure. As I mentioned, each of the three sections on the parcel is fenced off from the others. There is also a gate in the front of the site to prevent unauthorized access. These measures will secure the site. It is in my professional opinion, the proposed concrete plant will not adversely affect the health and safety of the public and the plan therefore meets the requirement of section 3.9.8A3. The third factor I'd like to go over is special factors. Uh, Neil previously mentioned that we received variances from some of the supplemental requirements for a concrete plant, but there are others which still apply to this site. Section 3.9.8A2 of the UDO requires that our plan be in conformance with those special requirements. The four special requirements for a concrete plant are listed in UDO section 5.3.6B. We received variances for subsection one and part of subsection three. Subsection two requires that the facility is not adjacent to an existing hospital, daycare facility, educational facility, place of worship, convalescent center, or assisted living center. The site is adjacent to vacant industrial land, a railroad track, Camden Avenue, and the right of way for Interstate 85. The closest hospital is about three miles away, closest daycare is about one and a half miles away, closest school is two and a half miles away, closest church is about two miles away, closest convalescent center is four miles away, and closest assisted living facility is about one and a half miles away. Accordingly, the site is more than a mile away from each of these uses. The next applicable supplemental standard is part of subsection three, which is that the site must be at least four acres in size. The entire property is listed at just above 10 acres in size. The area being leased for the concrete plant is approximately 4.11 acres. Finally, the last subsection requires a fence along any portion of the site which faces public streets. The leased area is not adjacent to any public street, but as noted earlier, there is a fence around both the leased portion of the property where the concrete plant will be located uh, and the entire site also is fenced. Therefore, the site plan meets all the limited use standards applicable to a concrete plant on this property. The final factor I would like to go over is review factors. As with any special use permit, there are 13 review factors which must be considered and I will address most of them. These factors are listed in UDO section 3.9.8B 1 through 13. With regard to circulation, the site plan demonstrates how the area is both secure and accessible. As an industrial parcel, free access to and from the site is not desirable to maintain safety. The leased portion can be accessed from two different locations, interior to the site, both of which will be secured by a gate. A sidewalk either will be installed across the parcel's entire Camden Avenue frontage or a fee and loo will be paid consistent with the UDO requirements. The parking required for this use is very low and is provided on site within the confines of the leased area consistent with subsection two. The fire departments reviewed the site plan and we have accommodated its requirements for location of hydrants and distances from streets, which addresses subsection three. Subsection four addresses the lighting plan for the site, which is shown on the last page of the site plan. This plan is compliant with all UDO requirements for lighting. No additional signage is sought as part of the site plan. Any signage sought at a later date will go through the typical sign permitting process for the city of Durham, which satisfies subsection five. Subsection six speaks to utilities, as the staff report mentions, all utilities are available on site. Addressing subsection seven, the project will not require any additional open space. Subsection eight deals with environmental protection. The site plan demonstrates that this project will not disturb any of the environmentally sensitive areas on the property. 
In fact, the site plan actually will decrease the total amount of impervious surface on the lot. Currently, the impervious area uh, on the site is about 79.4%. Our site plan will reduce that number to 70.4%. Because this is a reduction in impervious surface area, no additional stormwater requirements are required, but we are making the situation better than it is today. If the site were vacant, and one tried to develop it today, the maximum amount of impervious the UDO would allow would be 70% with the implementation of stormwater controls. At 70.4%, we're bringing the site almost all the way into compliance. Regarding subsection nine, buffering, the site plan shows that the least area for the concrete plant will be screened by UDO, compliant landscaping, and buffering for this type of use. Given the industrial nature of this corridor, the use will have no significant adverse impact on noise, odor, or lighting experienced by other properties in the area, which addresses subsection 10. Addressing subsection 11, this use is compatible with other uses along the Camden Corridor north of I-85. In fact, this is an excellent location for this use. Uh, it's in my professional opinion, the proposed use also is consistent with the policies contained and the comp plan for location and establishment of industrial uses as required by subsection 12. Um, if you all have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Thank you, Mr. Pabst. Yes. Questions for Mr. Pabst by members of the council. Uh, Councilmember Austin. Just a clarifying question that you, you referenced um, sidewalks on the frontage of Camden Avenue. Yes, sir. Um, or payment in lieu, and the report that we have just references the payment in lieu. Can you clarify that? Yes, yeah, so part of the UDO requirements for development of this property is to either build a sidewalk mm -hmm. or pay a fee in lieu. Mm -hmm. It's not been determined which we're gonna choose at this point. Um, so that will be determined at a later date. Great. But I, I believe Ms. Councilmember Austin's point is that, I, I believe if the staff report does say that you will be making a payment in lieu, does it not? It says they propose. But, yeah. uh, Danny Coulter for the planning staff. Yes, that is correct. They did choose that on the, si on the actual site plan. That is referenced, and there's a special condition note on the site plan stating that they will pay a certain fee in lieu of the public sidewalks. I guess that's been answered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Thank you for that question. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Pabst? Just um, in regards to the... Um, the distance from, I, I, I didn't quite hear exactly how far away you were from. I think it's, um, which, which waterway are you closest to? I think right on the northern side of Camden. Ellerby Creek. Ellerby Creek. So the distance from Ellerby Creek is how much? Uh, the distance from Ellerby Creek, I don't have that exact dimension, but it's pretty substantial. There's if you look at the site plan, again, there's three leased areas on our property. Then there's another property to the north that adjoins Ellerby Creek that buffers our property from Ellerby Creek. Do so you, our site's further upland out of the floodplain. Do you, do you study, I guess, do you actually take into account, because it is a swamped area, mm -hmm. the water table itself and how that feeds into Ellerby Creek? So it's an interesting question. I heard somebody mention this earlier. So part of the city stormwater ordinance, based on the baseline dates of when the ordinance was established, with this being an existing site and being a redevelopment, there's an alternative op option for compliance, which shows that if you reduce, if your site's less impervious than prior, and you reduce the nutrient loads by 10%, which we do, then you're exempt from having to provide a stormwater measure. Yeah. So, so uh, Mr. Culture thought that perhaps in addition to the reduction in the impervious surface to the 70.4, mm -hmm. that you might also be providing another VMP, but that's not the case? No, sir, it's not. Okay. All right, uh, any other questions? Uh, Council Member Caballero. Yeah, I just, I and this may be, on, be beyond the scope, so Go ahead. it is. Um, what kind of requirements do you have to do around air quality as a cement or concrete producer? Well, specifically to air quality, a lot of the aggregate's going to be constantly wetted. There's uh, well water, reclaimed water, potable water, 
and there's going to be a sprinkler system that essentially keeps the site moist to tamp the, the tamp it down, so to speak. Okay, but there's not actually any, and, and again, this may not be, this may be beyond what we're dealing with right now. I'm just curious. Beyond that, I mean, like, what are the industrial requirements for y'all, like, through the EPA or what? Right. So there are state and EPA requirements, and one of which is a spill prevention plan, which the site will have. Okay. The other is a SWIP, an SWPPP, which uh, this also has, and it just addresses those types of measures that you're mentioning, like dust control, uh, noise control, those types of items. Right. And then what was the distance to the closest? I heard for the daycare it was 1.5, that was the closest, and then the assisted living, everything else was longer or further away than that. Yes, ma'am, correct. And then with the closest residential, it was listed earlier, but I missed it. Let me go back and pull that. I, I think that was in the staff report. I don't think we mentioned Yeah, that. I don't think it is in here either. Maybe I just read it then. Danny Colts for the planning staff. Um, we analyzed that at one time. I think the closest residential property was about 410 feet from that, uh, from that I site. I suck it like that. What does that mean? Like linear, linear feet, <laughs> 410 uh, li linear feet distance okay. from the actual property. Yeah. yeah, and to clarify, the closest residentially zoned property is, is owned by Mr. Dan Wall. Um, the closest residential property on which there is a residence is on the other side of I-85. Okay, thank you. 410 feet is a full-size soccer field. Thank you. Thank you for The length well. of a full-size <laughs> soccer field. A, a little bit more, 50 feet <laughs> more than the length of a full-size soccer field. Thank you, Now, Are there any other questions? So, just one. When you factor harmony, do you factor in um, the impact around climate change? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? When you factor in harmony, do you factor in any any adjustments due to climate change? No, that's above my uh, pay grade. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Mr. Pabst. Uh, thank you. I believe you have another witness, another expert witness, Mr. Ghosh. Yes, ma'am. I think I should. I think I should first ask: uh, Is there anyone else that, here that would like to question this witness? I believe I'm required to ask. Okay, Mr. Ghosh. Thank you. Our next expert witness will be Mr. Andrew Topp at VHB. He conducted a traffic study, um, and uh, we are tendering him as an expert witness. Thank you. I accept Mr. Topp as an expert witness based on the uh, Thank you. on uh, Exhibit B. All right. Uh, good evening. I'm Andrew Topp, a senior project manager uh, with VHB. Uh, you've seen our, my resume already, but let me know if you have any questions about my qualifications. As a traffic engineer, our firm was engaged to review traffic impacts of the proposed industrial use at this location and to make recommendations for any traffic improvements needed to mitigate those impacts. In doing so, we did prepare a traffic study, a copy of which uh, is behind my resume in Exhibit B. I personally oversaw the traffic study for the project. Importantly, as noted in the staff report, a traffic study was not required by the UDO or other city policy for this site. However, the applicant knew that this would be uh, an issue of concern to both you and the Board of Adjustment, and therefore commissioned us to do this work. Uh, we took uh, traffic counts on July 10th of last year, which was a Tuesday. It, since then, uh, the only new development of which we're aware is the approve, approval of the expansion of the water treatment plant at 1900 Camden. The facility existed. Uh, at the time we did the original study and do not believe that the proposed expansion will have any effect on the ultimate conclusions of our original study. The study monitored traffic at the existing driveway for the proposed uh, facility along Camden Avenue, the existing driveway, the Sunrock uh, facility on Camden, and the intersection of NC55 and Camden Avenue. Uh, in addition to counting all uh, trips, we also kept track of the volume of industrial traffic. After taking traffic counts, we analyzed current levels of service at the studied intersections. We also ran a predictive model to measure the effect of truck traffic that will be generated by the site using IT standards to estimate how traffic in the area will be affected by the proposed concrete plan. For that analysis, we assumed a background rate of 3% as required uh, by, the city, uh, by the City of Durham TIA requirements. From the counts of existing traffic, we found that all studied intersections operate at a level of service C or better. We also found that there are presently 160 treks representing approximately 16% of the total traffic 
moving along Camden Avenue during the count period. Uh, this is a significant because this is the primary route that trucks leaving the proposed facility will travel. Our study for the proposed facility presumed that at least 60% of the industrial traffic leaving the site will travel west on Camden. This equates to roughly 50 more trips in that direction a day. We also found that in a day, roughly 160 trips will be produ produced by the proposed uh, facility. With the estimated distribution of traffic from the site, we found that all of the study intersections will operate at a level of service C or better. The highest increase in delay at any stop controlled approach across both the AIM and PM peak periods was only 1.2 seconds per vehicle when comparing no build conditions without the site to the build condition, conditions with the site. None of the intersections experienced a drop in level of service with the addition of traffic originating from or um, uh, proposed or, or generated by the proposed new plant. Um, there's not an existing traffic problem in the area. This is due, this is true despite the number of industrial trips this area experiences each day. Furthermore, the proposed facility will not cause any significant increase in the amount or nature of the flow of traffic in this area. Therefore, it is in my professional opinion that the proposed concrete plant will not have any significant adverse effects on the flow of traffic in this area and it is in harmony with the compatibility of the surrounding land uses. Furthermore, the number and location of access points is sufficient to handle the traffic reasonably estimated to be produced by the site. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time related to the traffic study. Thank you, Mr. Topp. Are there any questions for Mr. Topp by members of the council? Does anyone else in the audience like to ask any questions for Mr. Topp? Thank you very much, Mr. Topp. And Mr. Ghosh, we'll move on to your next expert witness. Yes, our next and final expert witness, I hope, uh, will be Mr. Jarvis Martin again. Uh, we are tendering him as an expert in the field of real estate appraisal. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Martin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, Jarvis Martin. <clears throat> I'm here to provide testimony in terms of the uh, impact that this proposed improvement may have on surrounding uh, property and values. Uh, as a part of my task, I reviewed the uh, site plan that's been spoken about. I visited an operation in Raleigh that the client currently operates <clears throat> in a similar industrial uh, location. Visited the uh, site in question as well as um, surrounding uh, properties. Uh, looked at sales in the area. Most of the, uh, all of the residential uh, development is on the east side of I-85 and that the I-85 Passover blocks any visual view from the residential side uh, over to the industrial side where the subject property is, uh, will be located. Currently existing uh, down the road from uh, this proposed site is an existing uh, Sunrock location that is more intense in its operation. It's a concrete plant, an asphalt plant, as, res as well as a concrete uh, crushing uh, facility. To show that there's uh, demand still in the area for industrial property, my research did reveal uh, earlier this year uh, acreage track of land that sold adjacent to the existing uh, concrete plant for over a uh, half million dollars to show that there is uh, some demand. Given that you have other industrial uses along this corridor to inclu include, as mentioned before, some of the city uh, facilities and other comparable industrial operations, uh, this proposed plant will be in harmony with those industrial uh, facilities as well as uh, with the existing uh, plant that's there today. Uh, based upon those facts, it is my professional opinion that the proposed concrete plant would be in harmony it would not have any uh, adverse impact on the industrial properties and or their use, that the establishment of an additional concrete plant near an existing uh, facility would not impede the uh, demand or value of those properties in proximity. So therefore, it is my professional opinion that the uh, major spe special use permit for this facility should be granted that it would be in harmony and have no adverse impact on adjacent properties. I'm available for any questioning. 
Thank you, Mr. Martin. Are there any questions for Mr. Martin? Any questions for Mr. Martin? Thank you so much, Mr. Martin. Thank you all. Mr. Ghosh? Thank you, and again, for the record, this is Neil Ghosh, attorney for the applicant, speaking again. Uh, at this time, I would like to move into evidence any uh, exhibits relied upon or referred to by our witnesses, I think all of which already have been entered into evidence, but just want to cover my basis. Um, as mentioned at the beginning of the hearing, the applicant's burden in this case is to submit competent material, substantial evidence into the record, showing that the proposal meets all the requirements in the UDO uh, for approval of the requested major special use permit and the site plan. Uh, in this case, we have met this standard. Uh, Mr. Papps did a good job of drawing your attention to the evidence in the record, which shows that the site has been designed in conformance with all applicable UDO standards. His firm has worked with your staff to make sure that that was the case. Uh, Mr. Top presented evidence to you related to traffic. Although no traffic study was required for this site, uh, as noted in your staff report, we did a study anyway because we knew that this would be a matter of concern. Um, not only did Mr. Top's report evaluate traffic as a whole, but it also evaluated the effect of, of the industrial nature of the traffic in this area. Um, he found that traffic today moves at a level of service, a C, which is acceptable to, under the city standards, and that the introduction of additional traffic from the proposed concrete plant would not result in a drop in that level of service. Um, his testimony further establishes that the new plant will be in harmony with and compatible with the surrounding land uses. Finally, Mr. Martin analyzed the effect that this use will have on property values. He concluded that property values will not be adversely impacted by the proposed concrete plan. The site plan has been reviewed by, uh, re reviewed and approved by all relevant uh, departments and is now subject to your approval. Um, therefore, we are requesting tonight your approval of both the, the major special use permit and the site plan. We're happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Any questions for Mr. Ghosh? Any questions for Mr. Ghosh? All right. Uh, we'll now hear from any opponents uh, to the application. Are there any opponents to the application? Any opponents? Hearing none, um, I'm going to ask that the city staff has a recommendation concerning the major special, special use permit. Thank you, Mayor Shrill, uh, council members. Uh, at this time, staff would recommend approval of the major special use permit M190002, provided that the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and information submitted to the council as part of the application. Move adoption. Uh, it's been moved that we grant the permit. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we grant the permit. Is there any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Mayor. I do want to say uh, relevant to the, uh, sorry, oh, I'm sorry, site plan approval. Uh, we also need a motion to approve the uh, major site plan. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the site plan. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Uh, on the on item 32, I finally found the uh, the the uh, the uh, what I believe to be a mix up between tree coverage and open space. It's in attachment nine, page three. I don't I doubt if that has any effect on anything we've done, but I did want to point it out. And Mr. Mayor, first of all, two apologies. One, I cited the wrong attachment number, and second of all. The items, the two uh, numbers were indeed transposed. The open space number was the tree coverage number and vice versa. Uh, we checked, check, uh, staff and I checked the site plan, which you all approved, and the site plan ref correctly reflected the percentages. So the error was only in the staff report and was not material to your approval. So thank you very much for bringing thank that you. to thank our you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, and we'll now move on to item 34, you, Consolidated Annexation, uh, East Carver Street. This is a public hearing. Right, they did talk about that. You're exactly right, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Good point. Hmm. Ms. Suniak's on her way up. I'm going to first, for the record, um, certify that all public hearing items that come before you tonight uh, have been advertised in accordance with requirements of law and their affidavits uh, to that effect on file with the planning department. Um, 
And um, Ms. Tuniak will be available here in just a moment. I see her running. To introduce the item, yes. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Sunyak. My apologies. No problem. <clears throat> Chris, uh, Chris Glass of the Timmons Group requests on behalf of the city to permanently close 1336 linear feet portion of Mist Lake Drive. <clears throat> Sorry. We're on uh, 34, Ms. Sunyak, Carver Street. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me catch my breath. It's that sort of night. Absolutely. We'll get there. I'll start again. Good evening. I'm Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. A request for a voluntary annexation and initial zoning map change have been received from Kelly Glover's of Horvath Associates on behalf of the city's public works department for a 10.18 acre portion of East Carver Street right of way located between Danube Lane and Club Creek Road. <clears throat> the purpose of this annexation is to ensure the city of Durham maintenance on the roadway once the Carver Street extension has been completed. <clears throat> This annexation petition is for a contiguous expansion of the corporate city limits. The area is presently zoned residential suburban 20. Thank you. Back up one for you. <laughs> <Okay. clears throat> this area is presently zoned residential suburban, suburban 20 and the staff recommends an exact translation of the zoning district. The parcel is designated low medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. Should the council act favorably, approval of the annexation petition and zoning become effective on September 30th, 2019. Staff recommends that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing property. The second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third is for the zoning ordinance. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. Uh, you've heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare the public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions by members of the council for staff. Hearing none, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone? There's no one signed up to speak. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to declare the public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. We need a motion to adopt an ordinance annexing East Carver Street into the city of Durham. So moved. Second. second. And moved and second that we, add, that we adopt the, annex for the, the ordinance for the annexation. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Now we need a motion to adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. And we need a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Now we'll move to item 35, Miss Lake Drive. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Chris Glass of the Timmons Group requests on behalf of the city to permanently close a 1336 linear foot portion of Mist Lake Drive, south of Camden Avenue. 
The right-of-way is currently dedicated and improved and serves as the entrance for the City of Durham's Department of Water Management and Administrative Services and Plant Maintenance. It's located at 1600 Mist Lake Drive. The street closure is a, larger, is a component of a larger site plan for the redevelopment project at the water management facility. If this request is approved, the closed right-of-way acreage will be added to the City of Durham property as shown on the associated street closing map, which is attachment four in the staff report. Also shown on the map is a 60 foot wide access easement between the city of Durham and the two adjacent property owners, that's um, Energy United property and BIG properties LLC to maintain access to their properties along the road. The request meets applicable uh, requirements. All comments have been addressed including a new utility easement with the Duke Energy, with Duke Energy since uh, utilities in that area will be relocated. Staff recommends the permanent closure of the 1336 linear foot drive of Miss Lake Drive and that the city enter into a road maintenance and access easement with the two neighboring properties, BIG Properties LLC and Energy United Propane LLC. I'll be happy to answer, answer, answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunyak. You've heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open and ask if there are any questions by members of the council for the staff. Hearing none, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? This is a public hearing matter. Hearing none, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is back before the council. We need a motion to adopt an order permanently closing uh, 1,336 feet of Miss Lake Drive. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, that we adopt the order. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. We need a motion to authorize the city manager to enter into a road maintenance and access easement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to authorize the city manager to enter a road maintenance and access easement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. We'll now move to item 36, consolidated annexation, Cardinal Oaks. Good evening. I'm Lance Brothers with the Planning Department. Regarding Cardinal Oaks annexation, case BDG 19-00006, a request for voluntary annexation and initial zoning map change have been received from Jeff Heath for a 0.452 acre area, including a portion of Kinnikeet Drive south of Cheek Road and two adjacent open space parcels. The site is presently zoned residential rural RR and Falls Jordan Watershed Protection Overlay District B, and staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning district. The parcel is designated very low density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. This annexation petition is for a contiguous expansion of the corporate city limits. The area of the annexation request is limited to public right of way and platted open space lots for the Cardinal Oak subdivision. With no anticipated change in property value, no fiscal impact analysis was performed. As the area of the request was previously included in a utility extension agreement approved for the Cardinal Oaks project dated June of 2011, no utility extension agreement is required for this annexation request. This new annexation petition is to enable the developer to request the city to take over that part of Kinnikeet for maintenance, which was left out during the annexation of the project. Should the council act favorably, the annexation petition and zoning would become effective on September 30th of 2019. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property. The second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third is for the zoning ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Druthers. Uh, council members, you've heard the report from staff. I'm now gonna declare the public hearing open. I'm gonna ask, is there any, are there any questions for, from council for members? Any councils from, any questions from members of the council for staff? <laughs> okay, uh, hearing none, is there anyone here in the audience who would like to speak to this item? This is a public hearing item. Hearing none, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed and I'm gonna uh, put the matter back before the council. We need a motion to adopt an ordinance annex in Cardinal Oaks. Move to adopt. Second. Second. It's been moved and second that we uh, adopt the ordinance. <laughs> Madam Clerk, could you please open the vote? 
close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. And we need a motion for a consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, could you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. And we need a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. Uh, we will now move on to Patterson, 30, item 37, Patterson Place Compact Suburban Design District. Uh, and uh, we'll now hear the report from staff. Good evening. I'm Lisa Miller with the Planning Department. Uh, the Patterson Place Compact Suburban Design District project is before you again tonight after it was continued at your May 6th City Council meeting. The supplemental information memo addresses questions that were raised by council in the public testimony at that meeting. Um, I'm gonna quickly provide an overview of the proposed actions and then a, a couple of changes that are incorporated into the packet since the May meeting. Uh, this project includes the creation of new zoning regulations to be applied to compact neighborhood tiers with an existing auto-oriented context through a UDO text amendment. It then applies those regulations to the Patterson Place compact neighborhood tier through the zoning map change, uh, establishing the placement of three subdistricts, the core, support one, and support two. Finally, it includes a proposed future street network to be fully designed and precisely placed as properties developed or redeveloped. This is in order to ensure smaller block sizes and to implement multimodal street design standards in the creation of new streets. Uh, I would like to note that while this particular project includes the adoption of new zoning regulations for Patterson Place, the text amendment was crafted anticipating that it would be available for application in additional compact neighborhoods, also with auto-oriented existing context through privately initiated zoning map change actions. There's just a few uh, changes to the project since the May meeting that I'll go over. Uh, we revised the proposed zoning map core sub-district area. Uh, it was reduced in line with a proposal from the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit that was discussed both with the Planning Commission and at the May meeting. Uh, and that is reflected in attachment E in your packet. Uh, we did make one modification to the text amendment, which is the prohibition of payday lenders anywhere in a compact suburban design district, uh, which you can see on page 11 of attachment B. Uh, and there have also been changes to the developer proffered commitments at 4950 Chapel Hill Boulevard to reflect agreement between the property owners and the new Hope Creek Advisory <laughs> Committee. Um, this is detailed in the memo and reflected in attachments D and J. The revised proffer is to modify the approved mass grading site plan, D18-00258, to pull grading out of the proposed transitional use area. It includes a revised transitional use area that varies in width rather than using a 200-foot TUA consistently across the property. That revised TUA is shown in attachment J. It reflects, it reflects increased TUA coverage for areas of greater importance to the New Hope Corridor and is referenced in the zoning map change ordinance, uh, attachment D. The property owners have also included commitments to apply some specific best practices to reduce the impact of construction and development on the adjacent corridor. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to remind you that this project will require five separate motions when you're ready to act on them, including the consistency statement for the text amendment, the text amendment, the consistency statement for the zoning map change, the zoning map change, and the future street network resolution. Planning staff recommends approval of all three of the components on this project. After three years of work with the community in this area, we're really excited about the agreement that we've come to <laughs> at this point. Um, and I would be happy to answer questions on the project or go into greater detail on aspects of it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. You all, we have We've now heard the report from staff, and uh, I'm going to declare the public hearing open. And uh, I'm going to first ask if there are questions for Ms. Miller uh, from members of the council. Just one. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the 200-foot um, TUA comment that Commissioner Alturk is mentioning, has that been consolidated in that conversation? I don't think I heard anything around, around that. You're referencing the 
Planning Commission comments, correct? Yes. I don't know what that is offhand. I can look at it and let you know. Hold on. This I know this is a comment about the sub district one and two. I'm just concerned specifically around if this is going to turn into a residential development and if the density bonus is used or not used in regards to how that comes across in this case. Got it. Kind of in general for the for the district that's being created. Yes. Um, yeah, so we do touch a little bit on that in the memo related to kind of the existing housing that's there and the likelihood of that turning over. Um, this is an area where there's not a, a whole lot of vacant property. Um, the vacant property that is there is RS20 um, and is primarily in the support one or two subdistricts. Um, so those are areas where we, the RS20 zoning currently allows only two units per acre, right? So we will be seeing a significant increase in what's allowable, either residential or commercial or non-residential development um, with the minimum or the buy right maximums that are in place there. Um, but we don't think that they are a significant enough bump to really push uh, the existing naturally occurring units to redevelop before there's a, an impetus for that affordable housing bonus density to be sought after. Um, I know one of the things that I, um, I think is relevant is, you know, we also mentioned in there the, the lift station issues that are being uh, worked on currently with the capacity um, that are going to uh, make it so that the development that happens here is going to take some time in the southern portion of the district. Um, but putting this in place will help us uh, signal to our staff that we need to be moving towards uh, accommodation of that level of growth. Okay, and will that accommodation of growth aspect be included in cases moving forward? Because my concern is that we leave it here in this compact design and not in the conversation in our future land map, you know, in, in our comprehensive planning, I should say. Related to the lift station or housing or? Both in relate, relation to how the speed of our, I guess, the additional lift stations that would be added and then where we want affordable housing or housing in general to, to, to kind of sit in relation to this compact design district. Um, yes, so related to affordable housing, you know, one of the things that's mentioned in the memo is the possibility of, and this is going to take continued coordination with the community development department, um, but in our conversations, um, in particular with, with Karen Lotto, um, there is possibility of prioritizing the Patterson Place area as a place where we want to put bond money that is earmarked for preservation of units. Yes. It's not restricted to downtown. Um, so there are possibilities of making that a priority and moving this forward can help us put that in place, but it's going to take continued conversation with them. Um, related to the lift station, um, that is that increased capacity project is one that is going to take a few years to accomplish. Um, and I think that the this project being complete is going to help prioritize that in a way that it then occurs within as short a time frame as possible, as opposed to put it pushing that out further. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Any other questions for staff at this point? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing open, uh, and uh, I'm going to um, maybe I already did that. Did I already open the hearing? Okay, well I opened it twice. Um, it's super open Better now, um, <laughs> and uh, we have. Four speakers who have signed up to speak on this item. Uh, they are Michael Waldrop, uh, Robert Healy, Patrick Biker, and Reynolds Smith. Um, uh, do you all have an order that you would like to speak in? If not, I'm going to do it in the order in which I said it. Uh, Mr. Waldrop, you're first. Uh, sir, you have three minutes. Uh, let me just say everyone's going to have three minutes. Let me also just say you don't have to take all three. <laughs> I promise, and I promise you that I won't. My name is Mike Waldrop, 5324 McFarland in Durham, in the heart of Patterson Place. Um, staff said three years. It, it was in October 20, uh, 2014 
that I sat with staff and basically a privately initiated attempt to take Patterson Place from the suburban tier to compact neighborhood tier was basically uh, pulled back into the city. And so I consider the, the duration of this effort to be considerably longer than, than just three years. But that having been said, I support it. I'm obviously very concerned, as I know I've expressed to all of you, about how we replace light rail. I'm working with as many people as are willing to listen to me <laughs> uh, to impress upon them. I think that there's logical alternatives. We don't have to, we don't have to consider all options. And, and, and so in any case, I, I urge you to support the rezoning, and we will move on to other matters, lift station, uh, transit of one kind in the 15501 corridor. We are cooking the planet. We've got to do things differently. We've got to build our cities differently. And this is a prime area between Durham and Chapel Hill for us to build a major, a very significant part of both of those communities. So I urge you to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waldrop, and for all your efforts on this. I, I recognize them, and I know the tremendous amount of effort you've given over to it over so, a long time. So thank you. I, I read it and I memorize it. Um, Mr. Healy, welcome. You also have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Bob Healy. I live at 839 Sedgefield. <laughs> Thanks for being here so late. I makes me proud to be a, uh, a resident of Durham. Uh, I'm here tonight uh, on behalf of the New Hope Creek uh, Corridor Advisory Committee, which uh, uh, has uh, uh, for the last 25 years, uh, advised the four local jurisdictions in Durham and Orange County on the implementation of the 1992 uh, New Hope uh, plan. I also represent the executive committee of the Headwaters chapter of the North Carolina Sierra Club with 800 members in Durham County and a mailing list of 1,300. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, uh, I have spoken to both Council and Planning Commission uh, regarding concerns we had with respect uh, to impacts on the corridor, especially uh, with regard uh, to the large property uh, that's owned by Beacon Properties on the uh, north side of 15501 to the east of New Hope Commons. Uh, <clears throat> we the, have had a number of discussions with Beacon uh, and uh, some of them facilitated by city staff. And I am pleased to let you know that we have come to an agreement that I think is fair uh, to the economic interests of the property owner, uh, as well as reasonably protective of New Hope uh, resources. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I and the groups that I represent uh, are agreeable to the staff uh, revision uh, of the plan as it affects the New Hope. Uh, we think that the TUA is an inventive way to, uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Lisa Miller in particular for her uh, patience and creativity in dealing with this. So uh, thank you very much, and I will not take any more of your time. Dr. Healy, thank you, and thank you also uh, for your work on this over many, many years. Too many years. <laughs> Mr. Biker, welcome. You have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, members of the City Council. I'm Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm with Morningstar Law Group, and I'm here tonight representing Beacon Properties and Durhill LLC, which owns a fairly large assemblage that Dr. Healy just referred to. That's within the northeast quadrant of the proposed Patterson Place Compact Suburban Design District you all are considering tonight. There are three main reasons for the Council to vote to approve the staff recommendation for this agenda item. First, it is clear from the input from the concerned citizens of Durham who have participated in this initiative over the past three years or so that they want to see a new type of development incentivized for this section of Durham. Long story short, based on what I heard during my attendance at all of the Planning Department's neighborhood outreach meetings, people want to see more transit-oriented development and less auto-dependent development than what we have seen so far on the whole in this section of Durham. Second, we need to approve what the staff has drafted in order for our community to implement new incentives for affordable housing. In that regard, I think the text amendment before you this evening does a good job of creating incentives for the private sector to build affordable housing without a public subsidy. No one can guarantee that these incentives will work, 
but these incentives are clearly better than anything we have tried so far. Third, this agenda item will create the mixed use, higher residential density development we need to support increased transit service between Duke University Medical Center and UNC Hospital, our region's two largest employers. I served as chairman of the Durham Area Transit Authority during the late <coughs> and early 2000s. And ever since then, I have always believed that we needed to create high density residential development between these two employment hubs in order for transit to be an effective option. These three reasons serve as an effective rationale to approve this agenda item, even though light rail is no longer on the table. Last, I want to acknowledge the hard work of Lisa Miller and Scott Whiteman in particular, as well as Planning Director Pat Young and Assistant Director Sarah Young, and I'm sure there are many others who worked hard on this important initiative. Accordingly, it is time to move forward with approval of the staff recommendation, and I hope you all will do just that this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Biker. Mr. Reynolds Smith, you also have three minutes, Mr. Smith. <laughs> I won't need it all. Um, I'm Reynolds Smith, 1905 Old Red Mountain Road in Rougemont. I serve on the Durham Open Space and Trails Advisory Commission, DOST for short, and I'm chair of its Open Space Committee. Um, I'm happy to say, as Lisa Miller uh, has already said, that we've resolved our differences with the developers. They've made major concessions, uh, and I thank them for them. And um, I, I want to thank the planning uh, department for, for its adroit plan in a difficult regulatory environment. And I was told the mayor intervened uh, to help us resolve our differences, so I want to thank him publicly uh, for that. Um, I feel good about how this has worked out. I wish the developers success with their project, and I hope they receive the zoning they need. And for the plants and the critters of the New Hope Woods, I'm sure they would thank, thank him too. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And thank all of you for your efforts. Much appreciated. All right. Is there anyone else here tonight who would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Mr. Kent. Thank you. Mr. Kent, give us your name and address. Uh, John Kent, 394 Cub Creek Road, Chapel Hill. Um, I just wanted to say that I've been involved in uh, the meetings we've had with uh, the developer for the area of Aiken Properties. And um, I'm pleased with the developments that have come out of those deliberations. And I look forward to um, seeing some of that all of it come to fruition. Um, and I want to thank staff for what they did, and um, I support this this measure. So thank you very thank much. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Did you ride your bike over tonight from Chapel Hill? You know, it's too, Steve, it's just too late. I, I labored over the Finally got Go, you, John. Go Durham <laughs> uh, schedule tonight, the last bus. Uh, out of here will only get me to um, Patterson Place. And uh, so uh, we got to change that. We're working we on change it. That. We're working on extensions. There you go. Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We're Thank you, yes. John. <laughs> Anybody else that would like to speak on this item? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to declare the public hearing closed. The matter's back before the council uh, and uh, to approve this item. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt a, a consistency statement Second. pursuant to the agenda. Thank you very Thank you. much, Council Member. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. So. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance as set forth in the agenda. Second. It's been moved and second to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to once again uh, move to adopt the appropriate consistency statement as required in the agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We again adopt the inappropriate consistency statement. Uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. 
Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Merritt, believe it or not, I'd like to move to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance as set forth in the agenda. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor, it is with pride and a job well done that I move to adopt a resolution designating the future street network for the Patterson Place compact neighborhood tier. Madam Clerk, uh, oh, second. Th oh, it's been moved and seconded. We adopt the resolution des des designating the future street network. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. <clears throat> and the motion passes 7 0. Great. So, this is a landmark moment, I think we can all say, and uh, to our to Lisa, Scott, Pat, all our planning staff, all the folks who've worked on this for so long. Uh, I think we've done something good. Uh, everybody's been thanked, but I also want to say that, I'll get to you in a second, Council Member, I thought we did a really good thing when we held this thing up last time. And uh, so kudos to us. I think we made a good decision. And uh, I think it, it, uh, it really allowed people to get together. And so um, well done, Council colleagues. Mr. Mayor, generally uh, when I listen to you, things turn out well, so. <laughs> Councilmember Caballero. I just wanted to say it's also uh, nice to see people figure out a compromise and that environmental, environmentalism and development do not have to butt heads. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think we're done now with item 38 and 37. 37, and unfortunately, uh, we're not done with this meeting. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to. Uh, the audience, though. We're now on sure. item 38, service fee analysis and the associated service area and fees for the Andrews Chapel lift station. <laughs> Mr. Joyner, welcome. Looking forward to your report. Good evening, Mayor Schull, members of council. I'm Robert Joyner, the Public Works Department. Item 38 is to hold a public hearing to consider adopting an ordinance setting the associated service area and fees for the Andrews Chapel lift station for August 5th. 2019. All items have been properly noticed in accordance with the City of Durham ordinances and policies and as required by North Carolina general statutes. Thank you, Mr. Joyner. Uh, you have heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions for Mr. Joyner by members of the council. Hearing none, are there any questions from anyone in the audience for Mr. Joyner? This is a public hearing item. Uh, Apparently not. <laughs> it's a popular crowd. <laughs> Apparently not. It, 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 hearing no comments, I'm now going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is back before the council, uh, and I believe what we need is uh, a motion to so approve the uh, lift station. Let's see. Uh, adopt an ordinance approving the Andrews lift station so fee analysis. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the lift station fee analysis and the associated service areas and fees. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joyner. We'll now move to item 39, service fee analysis and the associated service fee and area and fees for the Copley Farm Sanitary Sewer Outfall. Good evening, Mayor Shull, members of the Council, Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Item 39 is to hold a public hearing to consider adopting an ordinance setting the associated service area and fees for the Copley Farm Sanitary Sewer Outfall for August 5th, 2019. All items have been properly noticed in accordance with the City of Durham ordinances and policies as required by North Carolina General Statutes. Staff recommends that Council adopt the ordinance setting the service area and fees. Thank you, Mr. Joyner. You've heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. I'm going to ask if there are questions for Mr. Joyner from members of the council. Hearing none, are there any comments or questions uh, from members of the, uh, of the public? Hearing none, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is now back before the council. We need a motion to adopt an ordinance. So moved. Okay. It's been moved and second to adopt an ordinance approving the Copley Farm Sanitary Sewer Outfall Service Area and Fee Analysis and Associated Service Area and Fees. Madam Clerk, we please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. There being no more business to come before this council, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 11.17. Mr. Mayor, given where we were about an hour ago, we, we, we were through the I'm, I'm so amazed. <laughs> Just absolutely we did, forward. We did better. Absolutely <laughs>